Tendai Wadi, giving thanks and praises unto the creator of the universe, who is the of Mizumakuru, our great ancestors. From Bidza Kunamurai, Africa, to the creator of Africa, be the glory. Greetings, African family. Welcome to the Al Kebalan Revivalist Movement and our YouTube channel, Al Kebalan Way. Welcome to the Al Kebalan Academy of Excellence. Black History Month program, the Lion Story System. Bro. We give thanks and praise if you're joining us here. We did have a few technical hitches. We're running a bit late, but we're glad we're back and we're black and you're here with us to take us through this most important event we've got this evening, Sister and Brothers. It's going to be a brand new presentation from our young lion, Shakara, and we're going to get to that just as soon uh, as we've gone through some preliminaries. So give thanks and praise, Sister and Brothers, if you're new to the Akebran Revivalist Movement. My name is Brother Ola Tunji Haru. I'm the Chief Officer of the Policy Department. And the Akebran Revivalist Movement has been here, serving new African community, particularly in the UK, since the year 6227, also known as 1987. Since the year of 2013, or 6253, the Akebran Revivalist Movement has been organising the Lion Story, our Black History Month, African Heritage Month, Black History Season program every October, sisters and brothers. Could we realize, in spite of the lofty aims of the founders of Black History Month UK, our call for you to hail up the legendary Achiaba Adai Sebo and the sisters and brothers organizing around the London Strategic Policy Unit who organize the African Jubilee year 1987 to 1988 to which brought forward Black History Month in the UK in October of that year. Although we honour those, we do know that Black History Month has been through some changes over the years. And sometimes we wonder, is it really our history or is it somebody else's history? We seem to have lost control of it in some way, shape or form. So we established the lion story, as we know that famous wise African proverb, until the lion tells its own story, tells of the hunt will continue to glorify the hunter. So we established the lion th story in 2253, 2013, to put Black History Month black on its feet, to tell the true history of African people around the world. And this year has been no different. We began with our Shemira, our African traditional worship, which happens on the first and the first Sunday of the month. And on that uh, day, we pay tribute to our recently departed warrior scholar and new ancestor, Baba Renoko Rishidi Okello. Then after that, on the ninth day of the October, our sister, we see on the screen here with me, well, our warrior scholar, Sister Amitai Lumumba, delivered a presentation again on the subject of Renoko Rashidi, but that was one specific, specifically for our Wototos, our children, because we know it's, not too, it's never too early for our children to know the truth about our history. And we do know that our Baba Renoko Rashidi did more than most to highlight and bring to us our story of the global African presence. Renoko Rashidi visited 124 countries to uncover the hidden history of Africans around the world, in Asia, in Australia, in Europe, wherever we were, which was everywhere. That's what he did. And Sister Amitai uh, organized uh, that presentation for our Wototos. And then last year, Gemma Day, last Wednesday, we had our young people, and I hit up our young people uh, for Africa Teen Talk, where our young people, those future warriors who are going to take up the baton from us, had a reason about issues affecting them, be it police brutality, to the COVID pandemic, to the issue of colorism, and much, much more, sisters and brothers. I want to hear up our young people on that panel, um, young Sister Konedu, young sister Maturtat, uh, young brother Rukiza, 
and Prince Munyaradzi, and for a short time, who lit a fire in the in the proceedings, a young brother Omari as well. I want to give thanks to all of those ably hosted and chaired and guided by Sister Senior Pioneer Kai Awagada Bandaka, Sister and Brothers. We give thanks and praises for that event. And we have to ensure, Sister and Brothers, that our young people are always part of what we do in service of our liberation. We give thanks and praises for that. And today, Sister and Brothers, our latest event, sowing the seeds of revolution, the history of Black History Month by our young warrior, Shakara. So we're gonna, I'm gonna hand over very soon to our host for this evening, Sister Amitai Lumumba, who's gonna introduce our speaker. Then he's gonna do our presentation. Please, sisters and brothers, share your thoughts throughout the presentation in the chat. When Brother Shakara finished, we'll share the link and you can come on and engage with us in person or in the chat if you so desire. And to round off, we're gonna hear from the spiritual leader of the Akebalan Revivalist Movement, Brother Lida Bandaka. He's going to give us our clothes this evening, sisters and brothers. So give thanks and praises for you being here and joining us uh, today. We appreciate you being here and with us. And just to add, sisters and brothers, for our African Heritage Season, Black History Month, on every Kujugulia, every Monday evening, our Akebalan is also on Galaxy Radio, Galaxy Afiwi, dot com and we're dealing with the same theme sister and brother african history month every could you go today every monday for this month and tomorrow will be no different and tomorrow we've got a very special treat for our listeners we have on the show all the way from the usa live our epic warrior scholar baba amwalmu baruti alongside his queen Enaya Mawusi Baruti, sister and brothers, African king and queen, breaking down how we create our warriors for the next generation. Don't miss that, sister and brothers. Galaxyafiwi.com tomorrow evening, 7 p.m. BST, so called. So I'm going to hand over the baton to our sister, Amitai Lumumba. She's going to introduce our speaker, uh, a speaker who is known to many in his community, born on Liberation Road. And I say, this is a presentation delivered over many years. But he's been working on it again, Sister and Brothers. He's, he's gone back to the drawing board and given it some new impetus and new flavor as well. So we're looking forward to that, Sister and Brothers. But without further ado, Sister and Brothers, I'm going to hand over to our sister, Siba Amitai Lumumba. Turn to my sister, Amitai. Tendamari brother Olatunji. Okay, Tendamari brothers and sisters, I'd now like to give you some background information about our young brother, Tafatwa. Our brother Tafatwa Shakara Mbandaka is the son of renowned community activist, brother leader Mbandaka. Brother Tafatwa is an experienced, multifaceted performer, writer, and workshop facilitator. He has been a revelation in the spoken word scene since his emergence at the end of 2003. And he has become well known for his ability to address everyday issues in an exciting, challenging, and uncompromising way. That is, both inspirational and informative. As a member of the formidable spoken word collective, Best Kept Secret, Shakara co-wrote, directed and performed in a number of theoretical productions, including Cochrane Theatre's 2009 hit, Star for President. Shakara is now applying those skills as a freelance journalist. He has been a regular contributor to the World Win newspaper since 2005, providing commentary 
and reportage on our, on our youth culture. He has written for various publications, including The Final Call, and is a regular contributor to Voice of Africa radio flagship show, Africa Speaks, and Straight Talk. In 2013, Shakara joined the team for the British Blacklist, the online magazine and database for Black British talent. The weekly Shakara Speaks On It column shed light on many aspects of the Black art and literature, past, present, and future. Shakara is not only a talented writer, but a purposeful one, a feature which has very much contributed to its fast growing reputation. And that ends my introduction to Brother Shakara. So let's join Brother Shakara now for his uh, presentation. Tendamwari. Tendamwari, I give thanks um, for the introduction and the hosting, and, we'll, and I know that we'll see you again shortly. Yeah. Um, right. Thanks, to Uncle Kinji, as well for for the introduction. All right, I'm gonna let's get started um, to the presentation. First of all, um, Tendamwari, uh, give be thankful unto the Mother, Father, Creator of the Universe, Kuzai Mazuru Mukuru. Give praises unto our great ancestors, Abibi Tumi, Abibi Fahodie, African Power and African Liberation for all African people. Um, thanking all those who have joined uh, us for today's presentation which has kind of been an annual thing to be honest with you um you know we started with the the history of black history month um which uh was actually a presentation that was devised by the spiritual leader of the al and the movement brother leader bandaka um and in one year um i was asked to deliver this presentation um and uh basically um, have developed new things out of it since. So the first iteration was Black History Month is dead, is a question mark. Um, and we was looking at basically a takeover um, of Black History Month, delving deeper into the purpose for which Brother Leader con constructed the presentation in the first place anyway, um, which was setting the record straight in relation to the history of Black History Month in the USA and the UK, primarily because there were a lot of misconceptions around uh, the above. Also, however, um, it was necessary um, to look at it in terms of the sojourn or, or as a reflection of the sojourn of African people uh, in general and the extent to which um, the British establishment had effectively hijacked the celebration of Black History Month. And so that was the context in which uh, the presentation evolved into questioning whether Black History Month is dead. Um, because every year, African people um, question the relevance of Black History Month and why we need a month and so on and so forth, simply because we don't know the history. And so this year, what I want to do is kind of develop on what I did last year, which is uh, delve deeper into the purpose for history, the actual real purpose uh, for history yeah so much if you've seen the presentation before much of the beginning part will be the same but we'll, del we'll delve into some different things uh nearer the end the middle and the end of uh the workshop all right so give thanks once again apologies for lateness yeah apologies for lateness do utilize a chat feature um and we will be taking questions uh, upon the conclusion of the workshop all right so black history month sowing the seeds of revolution and we'll get into the reason for that title a little bit later on however for now um the first thing that i want to do is outline some of the um key questions yeah that this presentation is designed to address why do we allow them yeah to give us a month to celebrate our history yeah uh, and by them we identify uh europeans the british establishment uh in general and whatever terms we want to use to refer to them but this is them yeah this is a common statement every time black history Month comes along we ask why do we allow them yes to give us a month to celebrate our history is black history month 
about celebrating African American history. Yeah, some people just believe that you know it, it's really just a, you know I'm saying the co-optation, you know, the hijacking of Black Americans, and uh, and often we it is asked why do we only study yeah uh, great uh, uh, people in history. Uh, who relate to the history of Africans in America. Yeah, this is a common query that is drummed up every Black History Month. How does Black History Month affect Black identity? This is a question that was, you know, relevant to the Black History Month uh, is dead presentation in the sense of the fact that realizing that we were, we were becoming more and more British and more and more identifying as British uh, as a people. All right. So that was um, that looking through the lens of black history month what is black history without a black identity all right that's the question right there um and then we have what is the purpose of history yes or and what is the purpose of black history what is the purpose of african history which i hope yeah to emphasize tonight with a few brief uh examples all right Okay, so let's move forward. So the first part, let's define history. Yeah, what what is history itself? Uh, and a dictionary definition of history is the study of the past, the study of past events, particularly in human affairs. The whole history of past events connected with a particular person or thing. Uh, the continuous, typically chronological record of uh, important or public events, or of a particular trend or institution. So that's a dictionary definition. But the master teacher, yes, the master historian, uh, Brother Robin Walker, yeah, has a definition of history where he says history, in its broadest sense, contains all knowledge not acquired in the present. Yeah, all knowledge not acquired in the present. And so we emphasize here that every discipline, every field of human en endeavor and activity itself has a history uh, so when we study science we are actually studying the history of accumulated knowledges sorry knowledge in the the what we within what we call science throughout human history <coughs> excuse me we have when we study mathematics we are accumulate we are studying the history of accumulated knowledge and methods of calculation yes throughout human history yes that's what we're actually studying okay uh when we study psychology we're studying the history of the human study of uh, the mind every subject in every field of human endeavor has a history so wherever we study effectively we are studying history because history in its broadest sense contains all knowledge not acquired in the present all right that means our knowledge because the present is only uh, a second if that makes sense kings and queens okay um and so we go forward in terms of defining history with a definition that touches on that gives us an inclination towards what the true purpose of history is and this is given to us by another great baba ancestor who I actually had the pleasure of meeting at Africa Liberation Day celebration in the 90s Kings and Queens in Broadwater Farm you know I'm blessed to have met um you know uh Baba John Henry Clark and Baba Yusuf Benya Cannon for that matter but Baba Baba Clark teaches us that history is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. History tells a people where they have been and what they have been. <coughs> Excuse me. Where they are and what they are. Most important, history tells a people where they still must go and what they still must B. All right. This is history. History is a clock that people use to tell their what political and cultural time of day. History is also a compass that people use to find who themselves on the map of human geography. History tells the people what, where they have been and what they have been, where they are and what they are. But I'll stop there. History also tells a people where they still must go and what they still must be. Therefore, there is a future projection function within the study of history. But I would like to emphasize this compass uh, example because it speaks to being on a journey. Yes, it speaks to being on a journey. And I, 
when I'm teaching young people in the Kevin Academy of Excellence or elsewhere, I use the analogy of being on a ship and me being on a ship in the UK and the rest of the class being on a ship in the Caribbean. And we are both trying to get to Mama Africa. And we both, in this endeavor, on this journey to Mama Africa, have a compass on each ship. And I asked the question, can I, on my ship, on the shores of Great Britain, use the compass of those in the Caribbean in order to find myself to Mama Africa? And the answer is, of course, no. And so history, you cannot use somebody else's history to chart your course for development, progression and prosperity in today's world. And so as a people, yes, with a shared history, we must identify using our own unique history, our own unique compass, where we are in the world and chart our course from where we are to where we want to go, as opposed to where somebody else is using their compass to get to where they are, kings and queens, all right? This is what Baba John Henry Clark is attempting to teach us with this particular uh, explanation of the concept of history. And I'm going to get through the first part of the presentation a little bit quicker than I normally do, just so I can get to the end, yeah, uh, and delve into some concepts. And I look forward to brothers and sisters coming on, yeah, um, asking questions, sharing their thoughts, their, 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 their perspective, their opinions, challenging me even. Yeah. Um, once the presentation is concluded um, and we enter more discussion, this is a definition of memory. Yeah. That is taken from a book on human uh, physiology. All right. You can see the uh, the uh, the source yeah, of this definition uh, at the bottom. But we I liken and we liken history to the historical, the collective memory bank of a people. And so in order to elucidate that, we find a definition of memory that relates to us as individuals. It says memory is the storage of acquired knowledge for later recall. Learning and memory, learning and memory form the basis by which individuals adapt their behavior to their particular external circumstance. Without these mechanisms, it would be impossible for individuals to plan for successful interactions and to intentionally avoid predictably disagreeable circumstances. Yes. So the function of memory in the individual, it forms a protective function. Yes. Without memory, it is impossible to learn. Because learning relies upon our capacity as human beings to recall information and use it in our present moment. That's what learning is about. Being able to recall information and apply it to our present day circumstance. And so the absence of a historical, a collective historical memory bank for a people will result in them being incapable of intentionally avoiding predictably disagreeable circumstances enslavement predictably disagreeable circumstances colonialism predictably disagreeable circumstances neo-colonialism we're going to get into that a little bit later on collectively define kings and queens as the ma'afa yeah just note that terminology ma'afa uh, and we'll get back to it a little bit later on. All right. So we're uh, to emphasize once more, we're relating the memory, our all our individual memory to our collective memory as a people and relating this to the concept of history. OK, without a knowledge of our history, we will not have the tools that we need. 
the information, the acquired knowledge that we need to adapt, to even understand our present circumstance. And if we don't understand our present circumstance, we will be incapable of adapting our behavior to suit the challenges of our present circumstance. And so we get to overstand that when we study our history, we have developed a few phrases that elucidate the, 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 the general themes yeah, that come from studying the history of African people. And the first is that before there was any history, there was black history. Before there was any history, there was African history because Africans are the first human beings on the planet. Africans are the first to evolve to the status of what is called Homo sapiens sapiens. Africans are the first to ask the questions, who, what, where, why, and when. Yeah? That's a fact of human history. And so because of this, Africa is the birthplace of humanity and the cradle of civilization. We're emphasizing that not only did humanity begin in Africa, but this thing called civilization, the development of cities and nations and human organization and politics and economics and uh, 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 mathematics and architecture and all fields of human activity had their foundation, their development among African people. I want to emphasize something here that I said Humanity began in Africa. I didn't say all human beings are African. These are two very different statements. Yeah? Both are political. I said humanity began in Africa. I didn't say all human beings are African. Why is that important? Stay tuned, kings and queens. All right. So in order to understand why a Black History Month was necessary, became necessary, we have to understand how African people have related to our own history as a result of the challenges that we have faced. And so within the book, When We Ruled, once again, by our illustrious Robin Walker, he explains a period of history whereby during the invasion, the conquest, the enslavement and the colonization of African people, those who were responsible for all of these atrocities felt the need to target and attack the recorded history of African people. And Brother Robin speaks, by the year 1900, European control over the world by colonial conquest was almost complete. In addition, they seized control over the media <laughs> and educational systems of the world. Therefore, what the world learned about itself came from or through a European source. Consequently, only stereotypes of non-whites were ever going to escape the censorship. In the case of the Far East Asians, no scholarship ever located them as the original founders of civilization itself. The mainstream could therefore tolerate Chinese history since it did not clash with 20th century fabrications that Europeans were the original founders of civilization. The mainstream could not, however, tolerate black history. Thus, it became important for propagandists, aka historians, to deny that the above literature even existed, or if not, deny that terms, if that the term, sorry, Ethiopian, Libyan, Kushite, Hamites, Moors, Zanj, and Sudanese, Sudanese refer to Negroes, unless, of course, such people were captured slaves. If that failed, the mainstream bitterly attacked the credibility of the ancient and modern scholars. This was not an entirely satisfactory approach since European historical scholarship is itself built upon the foundations laid by Herodotus, Devolny, 
Dupius, Sir William Jones, Champollion, Rawlings and Darwin. To attack these scholars was therefore equivalent to scoring an own goal. There is a there is more here of, that I've taken out for the sake of time, whereby he goes into the fact that early European historians uh, and the historians of who are recording history in Greece and Rome record a lot of what they inherited from African civilizations of the Nile Valley, Kemet in particular. Um, they they record the 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 the, uh, the early uh, Arabic, yeah, even scholars, yeah, record uh, a lot of what uh, was happening across the continent when they were traveling and also invading and conquering um, across the, the continent and bucking up on African peoples. And so it gets to this point whereby they're looking to solidify colonialism uh, and update it and further embed it within the psyche of African people. And in order to accomplish this, they must negate the history of African people so that they could paint an image of a dark continent full of savages and barbarians who never did anything, never created anything and never built any a thing. And so because of this, and because as Baba, Brother John, sorry, uh, Robin Walker says, the world now through colonization was getting to know about itself through the Europeans. We were taught about ourselves through Europeans and therefore lost a connection. Yes, to a significant degree with a knowledge of ourselves and a knowledge of our history. And so we go through the Ma'afa. And it gets to the point whereby we have made the institution of enslavement very expensive for the European. We're rebelling. We're campaigning. Sometimes we're not even rebelling, but slave driver just end up dead from plantation and nobody don't know where I go on. Yeah? We have one of the untold stories about the Ma'afa enslavement period is the extent to which Africans engaged in labor were also engaged not just in hard labor, the picking of the cotton, the chopping of the cane, yeah, the harvesting of tobacco, but also skilled labor. Yeah, so when we look at the fact that. In when Brother Lee the first did the presentation, he would identify a number of different achievements of African people, yeah, throughout history. And a number of these achievements were focused on the post-enslavement era in the 1800s. And it just so happens that Africans are responsible for many inventions that are common in today's world. For the sake of time, we're not going to go into it. But this is a testament to the fact that. Africans were also always engaged in skilled labor throughout the enslavement process. And that skilled labor, yes, uh, led to the development of inventions and so on and so forth that fueled, yeah, the Industrial Revolution. All right. And so coming through this process, brothers and sisters, a man by the name of Carter G. Woodson is born in 1875. This is the father of Black History Month. And as we say every year, enough times Black History Month comes along and you never hear the name Carter G. Woodson. That is changing, yeah? And, you know, through the efforts of ourselves and others, more people are starting to connect, yeah, the history and the purpose of Black History Month. Baba Carter G. Woodson. He is the second African to have achieved a PhD from Harvard University in 1912, the first being W.E.B. Du Bois. Pay attention to the fact that this is a PhD now, the highest achievement in Western academia in 1912, which is the era of Jim Crow and lynching and segregation in the United States of America. So you have to have been an exceptional African to have achieved this, yeah, in America during this period. Baba Carter G. Woodson studying history, yeah, and realizing and recognizing the importance of history 
for African people founds an organization, yeah, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in 1915, which is now referred to as the Association for, the, for African American Studies. He founds the Journal of Negro Life and History in 1916. All right. Um, and he also founds a publishing company. Black History Month itself, yeah, was founded as Negro History Week in 1926. Bear in mind, kings and queens, that the, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History already exists. The Journal for Negro Life and History already exists. So you can take from that that uh, Negro History Week was never designed to confine the study of African history to a weak period. These are people who have developed institutions that are studying the history of African people day in and day out. And they create a focal point, a celebration, a ceremony, yes, to highlight, to present, to develop on and engage the wider community in what they have been developing throughout the year yeah one of the things that they used to do is develop materials and distribute it yeah to black schools yeah um you know what i'm saying throughout the, the 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 nation state of the united states of america yeah so that children and adults even would have a, uh what's the word access yeah to resources through which they could study uh the history of themselves this is before there was an internet yeah uh and 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 resources to study were as abundant as they are today so they created resources for the use of african people Baba Kari G. Woodson is also an author. Um, his most famous book is The Miseducation of the Negro, which was published in 1933. And we're going to take a few um, quotations. In fact, I'm just going to read one quotation from Baba Kari G. Woodson. And I'm going to read the one that is most pertinent to the presentation that we are delivering today, where he says, history shows that it does not matter who is in power. Those who have not learned to do for themselves and have to depend solely on others never obtain any more rights and privileges in the end than they did in the beginning. The key word here is power. Baba Carter G. Woodson understands that history, the study of history, has a relationship to power. Power dynamics in the world and the acquisition of power by those who have been dispossessed of it. There is a relationship between knowledge of history and a people's capacity to be able to do for themselves. There is a, a relationship between a people's knowledge of history and whether they are condemned to solely depend upon others. And this also suggests that Baba Carter G. Woodson's focus on history within that, he understood that one of the things that we should not be depending on others for is for the writing and the telling of our history. Because if history shows that it does not matter who is in power, those who have not learned to do for themselves have to depend solely upon others, then we need to learn to do for ourselves. If they tell our history, the story they tell will empower them. If we tell our history, the story we tell can empower us we're going to skip this for the sake of time we just want to highlight a great mama who was also born in the same year as baba carter g woodson who became a great educator a lot of this information that was being developed and uh by historians was uh making its way into classrooms and people like mama mary mcleod bethune were inspired yes to give african children a sense of self-worth through the teaching of our history. She says, I am a, my mother's daughter and the drums of Africa still beat in my heart. They will not let me rest while there is a single Negro boy or girl without a chance to prove his worth. I hope ones and ones are understanding, understanding where we're going with this in terms of 
the purpose of history in relation to things like power, self-worth, collective memory, and so on and so forth. So we get to Black History Month in the UK. Why and how did Black History Month start in uh, the UK? First of all, we have to acknowledge the presence of forerunners, yes, to the founding of Black History Month, namely Baba Obi Egbuna, the father of Black Power, the Black Power movement in the UK, Mama Claudia Jones, the mother, mother activist and mother of Notting Hill Carnival, and people like Audley Evans, Paul Stevenson and Owen Henry, who are responsible for having founded and initiated and led the uh, Bristol bus boycott, Kings and Queens. Many people don't know that we had a bus boycott uh, in the UK, which was inspired by the Montgomery bus boycott in the USA. I was waged against what was called the color bar. Yes, discriminatory, discriminatory hiring practices uh, on buses, yeah? Bus services um, in the UK. The Bristol bus boycott was contemporary in 1963 with the March on Washington. And so we also, well, actually, I'll get into that in a second, but there's a history of activism in the UK from the time that Africans arrive in the UK in recent history, which is after what is called the Windrush, yeah, uh, in the late 1940s. As soon as we get off the boat, there's activism that we're engaging in. All right. Then we get to this man by the name of Achiaba Adaye Sebo. He is the father, the founder of Black History Month in the UK. Once again, we often get around to this time of year and the name Achiaba Adaye Sebo is never called Kings and Queens. Very interestingly. All right. But he's born and raised, yeah, um, in Ghana and exists is, as a young man in Nkrumah's Ghana, the revolutionary government of the Asajefo Kwame Nkrumah. At some point, he moves to the United States of America and then to the UK in the year 1984. The 1980s in the UK is a turbulent time for Africans. Yes, it's a time when Africans are engaged in a critical mass of political and social activism and activity. We have the New Cross Massacre taking place in the year 1981, January of 1981, which for those who are not aware, was what we understood to be a racist firebomb attack, one of many racist firebomb attacks that took place that was waged against a birthday party full of young African men and women. A an incendiary device was thrown into this party, killing 13 of the young people in the fire between the ages of, of uh, 13, I believe, and 20, they were all in their teens and their 20s, kings and queens. The following year, another young person, the 14th young person, died from injuries incurred during this fire. This was a landmark in the, the, the historical development of African people in the UK. And as Brother Lila says, this was the single largest, biggest tragedy, yeah, that had engulfed the African community in the UK since our coming from Africa and the Caribbean in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. The British establishment and the police criminalized the young people in the party as opposed to properly investigating it within the context of the racist abuse and attacks that were prevalent across the country and in particular in New Cross. This inspired two significant events. 
Uh, the first being the National Black People's Day of Action on March the 2nd, 1981, 25,000 African men, women and children marching yeah, in the name of justice, not just in relation to the New Cross Massacre. It was sparked by the New Cross Massacre, but in relation to the range of injustices that we were facing within British society. Another significant event, which I don't know if we've taken, we've really contextualized the importance of this event enough. Bearing in mind, I'm, I'm focusing on this a little piece more than I might have, because we are in the year 2021, which is, yeah, 40 years, yeah, since all of the 40th anniversary of all of these events. The second event is the Brixton Uprising. Yeah, the Brixton Uprising. April 1981. Operation Swamp, which is a police operation that of stop and search against African people in Brixton in South London. Basically, literally swamped the area with police, stop searching and beating up predominantly young African men. And eventually... The man them decided to them go and fight back. That sparked the Brixton Uprising. The Brixton Uprising flowered and mushroomed into uprisings all over the country. There was another Brixton Uprising in 1985, yeah, which was sparked by the shooting of Sister Cherry Gross. Yeah. Another uprising in broadwater farm another one that one again i don't know if we've really properly contextualized that in relation to the history of africans in the uk broadwater farm 1985 sparked by the killing of mama cynthia jarrett in police custody yeah so this is the the uh the environment that baba achaba adayesebo entered into when he arrived in the UK in 1984. So all of this energy flowered into what became to be known as African Jubilee Year, marking some significant anniversaries of that era, which was the centenary of the birth of the most eminent prophet Marcus Messiah Garvey in the year 1987, Papa Garvey being born in 1887. 25th anniversary since the founding of the OAU, the Organization of African Unity, which was in 1963, and the 150th anniversary of emancipation from slavery, yeah, when the British decides to them go and stop the slavery thing uh, in the Caribbean, which was uh, in the year 19. 35 ish yeah between 35 and 38 because there was a period of uh a print apprenticeship uh <laughs> following uh the ending of enslavement which we won't go into today but the the, 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 the principal inspiration behind the founding of black history Month, in the words of Baba Achiaba Adayesebo himself the inspiration for Black History Month came from an incident that happened at the GLC, where I worked as the coordinator of special projects. A colleague of mine, a woman, came to work one morning looking very downcast and not herself. I asked her what the matter was, and she confided in me that the previous night when she was putting her son Marcus to bed, he asked her, Mum, why can't I? be white so when this incident with marcus took place in london it dawned on me that something had to happen here in britain i was familiar with black history month in america and thought that something like that had to be done here in the uk because if this the uk was the fountainhead of colonialism which it was uk dominated over a quarter of the planet yeah during its empire upon which they said the sun would never sit. If this was the founding head of colonialism, imperialism and racism, and despite all of the institutions of higher learning and research, and also the cluster of African embassies, you could still find a six-year-old boy being confused 
about his identity even though his mother had tried to correct it at birth to explain the last sentence marcus's mother had named him after the most eminent prophet marcus Messiah garvey attempted to instill him with a sense of self-worth self-pride and self-respect and a connection to his history and still yeah because he went to school and was taught the history of great white men and couldn't see himself in his learning couldn't see his reflection in all the great things that human beings have done in history he developed a complex about his blackness his africanness and wanted to discard it for the sake of aligning with the greatness of white people the greatness of the great british white man this is what a six-year-old the conclusion that a six-year-old came to as a result of the educational process that he was subjected to within the, edu the British education system. Baba Achaba Adaya Sebo continues. So when this incident with Marcus took place in London, it dawned on me that something had to happen here in Britain. I was familiar with Black History Month in America and thought that something like that had to be done here in the UK because, oh, sorry, I've read this already, haven't I? For, forgive me for the um the repeat slide kings and queens all right so black history month uh uk objectives as taken from the brochure yes that accompanied the first celebration of black history month in the uk during that year the purpose is and forgive the typos here the purpose one to promote positive public images and understanding of Africans and people of African descent and encourage the positive teaching and development of their history, culture, and struggle. Emphasizing that they understood very clearly that the celebration of Black History Month was about Africans and people of African descent. Yeah, some years ago, I learned about, we learned, about the this idea that October is diversity month, uh, where we study the diverse peoples of the UK. Um, what I learned recently is that diversity month is actually an initiation of the European Union. Yeah, in most of Europe, Black History Month is celebrated in February, as it is celebrated in the United States of America. Uh, the UK is the only place where it is celebrated in uh, October, yeah? And so for some reason, the European Union has initiated Diversity Month, where we celebrate diverse peoples, yeah? And the UK uh, has taken on uh, this banner, at least to some extent, yeah? So we want to emphasize, yes, that Black History Month was about, designed and developed by Baba Carter G. Woodson and Baba Achiaba Adaya Sebo and others to study the history of Africans and people of African descent and encourage the positive teaching and development of their history, culture, and struggle. Two, to support African organizations and liberation movements based in London. We're going to get back to this liberation movement business based in london this was again was a part of african jubilee year and this is the african jubilee year declaration the african jubilee year declaration is therefore a testament of london's solidarity with africa and the international struggles against apartheid remember this is in the, year, the 1980s the the anti-apartheid movement which was kept strong by the African world, yes, was not a multicultural movement to begin with. <laughs> yeah, bear this in mind. Was strong in the 1980s. So we, we understood clearly at this particular period of time that we were still engaged in an anti-colonial fight. When you talk about liberation movements, yeah, in London, we understood this. There was something about African people at this time 
whereby we understood that liberation was still on the agenda. By the designation of October as Black History Month, it is our expe expectation that Africa, Africa's ideals, shall forever be manifested in the upliftment of the African personality. Yes, not all these Africans in our schools, institutions of higher learning, communities, borough councils, and especially in the hearts and minds of politicians. These are the names of some other notable figures. Yeah, uh, who were instrumental in the development of Black History Month in the UK, namely uh, Herman Oosley, Linda Bellos, and the late Bernie Grant, who actually went into Parliament, yeah, the MP, went into Parliament on his first calling as an MP in the year 1986, dressed not too dissimilar from how you see him dressed here, yeah, and caused consternation in British society <laughs> as a result. This is a flyer, yeah, for the first, um, one of the early Black History Month presentations, say, celebrations on the 1st of October in the year 1987. And as you can see, yeah, um, the African Jubilee Year banner is in the image. And then on the flyer, the person, the main, the keynote speaker for the event yeah, was uh, Dr. Maulana Karenga, yes, of the US organization, founder of the celebration of Kwanzaa. And that was on Thursday, the 1st of October, 1987. Now, this always amazes me, yeah? Throughout the month, 1987, no, sorry, throughout the year, Africa Jubilee year, yeah? Including the month of October, 1987, this was, yeah, the lineup of Africans, yeah, who were brought to the country. Not, not This is not those who are already here now, yeah? Who were brought to the country to join in the festivities, yeah? Baba John Henry Clark, Baba Yusuf Ben Yekanan, Sally Mugabe, the then uh, wife of Robert Mugabe. Robert Mugabe was unable to come, bearing in mind that that was significant because Zimbabwe had just got its independence from, won its independence from in a military struggle uh, in the year 1980. Yeah. And the chart, them time, there was uh, Zimbabwe today, Azania tomorrow, Azania the revolutionary name of uh, South Africa as designated by the Pan-African Congress of Azania. The High Priestess of Soul, Nina Simone. Grassa Machel, the wife of Samora Machel, then president of revolutionary Mozambique. Mama Frances Chris Wilson, yeah, our great illustrious ancestor psychiatrist. Max Roach, the great jazz musician, composer of uh, the great album, the Freedom Now Suite. Check it out if you don't know. Burning Spear, the great Rastafari reggae music warrior. Baba Tony Martin, the foremost scholar on the life and works of Baba uh, Marcus Messiah Garvey. And Hugh Masekela. Very significant, as I've said already, because of the uh, anti-apartheid movement to have an African from South Africa joining us. Let's get into... The unfinished revolution. The unfinished revolution. As I said, we understood at the time in the 1980s that liberation was still on the agenda. Still had to be on the agenda. Why? Because we had been through this process of a revolutionary era that picked up space in the 1960s. That was fueled by all of the great people that you see depicted here and more. For the sake of time, we're not going to go into the significance of all of these people. However, we will highlight two of them. Yes. Um, and those two are going to be Omawale Malcolm X and Baba Kwame Toure. The reason why is because these two great men were instrumental in the transition away from the use of the term Negro, yes, in the United States of America, to affirming blackness and Africanness. So Mawali Malcolm X starts an organization called the Organization of Afro-American Unity and begins to refer to our people, say we must discard the term Negro, and in the A's and objective of the OAAU, it is said, that we are going to discard the term Negro and adopt and affirm black man and woman 
African, African American, and Afro American as the relevant terms, the viable terms for referring to ourselves. Baba Kwame Toure and another great African who works in Baba Kwame Toure in an organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. It is said that Baba uh, Mukasa Dada, aka Willie Ricks, yeah, uh, coins the term black power. And the term is popularized by Sorry, I just looked at the 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 uh the chat and I'm I'm I've got a message saying that somebody can't hear me clearly. Do let me know if I can be heard clearly, yeah? Um if if you're unable to hear me clearly, let me know. Um and I'll see what I can do, all right? But I was under the the impression that I could be heard clearly. So, I know uh you know all right, so Baba Kwame Toure in the year 1966 popularizes this term black power. And this is the, the era in which Negro History Week becomes Black History Month. Yeah, uh, we see the, the, we, we know of these anthems. Yeah, y'all gifted and black and say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. This revolutionary era, yes, is also uh, on the African continent. And these are some of the great men and women who were leaders of either revolutionary governments or revolutionary movements on the continent of Africa. Time doesn't allow for us to go into all of the history here. However, we will be, we will be touching on some of it later on. All right. But this is the era in which many African nations are fighting for liberation. And it results in what is called the independence movement. Yeah. Shout out to Baba Dedan Kimati and all those of the Kenya Land and Freedom Army, also known as the Mau Mau. Yeah. Currently reading a book about the Mau Mau. Very, very interesting. But as Omawale Malcolm X said, it took for the Mau Mau to bring liberation not just to Kenya, but over half of Africa. Because the armed rebellion that the Mau Mau engaged in, in Kenya in the 1950s, the colonial authorities basically decided that they, they, they didn't want no replicas of that, yeah, uh, anywhere else on the continent. And so it forced them to the position whereby they had to sue for peace and grant what is called independence. There's a question. Well, there is no really question, actually. I was going to say there's a question as to whether we got independence or not. There is no question. There was no real independence, yeah, in a mass scale. But it was understood at the time by those such as Baba Asaja for Kwame Nkrumah that the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is linked to the total liberation of the African continent. It was understood by Papa Patrice Lumumba at the time that it was his responsibility to lead the people of Congo to make Congo the center of the sun's radius for the entire African continent. These men and women understood that it wasn't just about the liberation of Fidem Owen country. That, their, that liberation meant the liberation of the entire African world. Yes? And they did many great things, which on another day we'll go into. It's also the lick. The Caribbean. Yeah? Yes, I... We have to hear that the Rastafari movement... For being one of the, if not the primary organized resistant movement in the 1960s and 70s and paying a heavy price for it. Yes, we could start with Pinnacle, 
the self-sufficient commune in the island of Jamaica, St. Catherine, 500 acres of land, yes, upon which the Rastafari movement under the leadership of Leonard Percival Howell was demonstrating what it meant to live as free and liberated Africans whilst challenging the colonial authority. Pinnacle was invaded and burned to the ground in the year 1954. Yes, you have the Coral Gardens massacre in Jamaica in 1963, whereby the government empowered people in Jamaica, its constabulary force, its police, its army, and ordinary citizens to capture Rastafari dead or alive under the orders of the Prime Minister, Bostamante. We have the man by the name of Walter Rodney, who is such a brilliant individual. Yeah, the author of the book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, which I'm also currently rereading. who attained a PhD by the age of 26, I believe it was, spent time living in Tanzania under the government of Mwalimu Julius Nyerere, teaching in university. In fact, he wrote How Europe Underdeveloped Africa while I was in uh, Tanzania. Begins lecturing in Jamaica at another point, teaching and engaging in warrior scholarship, whereby he's not satisfied to just jam in his university ivory tower, but his role as a lecturer took him out onto the streets with the masses of the people, as he puts it, grounding, groundings with his brethren. He returns to Guyana to organize among our people in Guyana and is assassinated by a neo-colonial regime in the year 1980. Similar story for Papa Maurice Bishop, President, sorry, Prime Minister of Revolutionary Grenada between 1979 and 1983. Town doesn't allow to go into the brilliance of this man and the government of which he was a part and the achievements, the many things that they achieved. Yes, whilst challenging the neo-colonial imposition of America in particular on the Caribbean during that time, uh, Maurice Bishop assassinated <coughs> in the year 1983. Yes, but these are all movements and people that were challenging the domination of Africa and African people by Britain, America, France, Belgium, Portugal, Spain, etc., etc., etc. And in the push for independence and independence being meaningless unless it is linked up with the total liberation of Africa and African people, the so called colonial powers recalibrated themselves to institute what the Asajj Kwame Nkrumah calls neo-colonialism, which we're going to explain shortly. This slide just gives expression to how all of that political energy affected the arts movement. We're not going to go into that all of that today, but just note the great people who are depicted here. The foundation for all of this, Kamagavi, eh? is the most eminent prophet and king because Papa Garvey had inspired, yes, was a focal point of inspiration for all of the movement, yes, that I've just elucidated. And he says of history, a people without knowledge of their history is like a tree without roots. Yes. So when we study our history, we're actually going through the process of rooting ourselves so we get to this 
element now, which is the true purpose of history. During which I'm going to dive into some of what they, the, the great men and women who I've just depicted, some of what they did, some of what they achieved, and how that can inform us today. What is the true purpose of history? We are in the midst of an unfinished revolution. The things that they were fighting for at that point in history have not been fully achieved. And in fact, some of what they were fighting for, there's been a regression in terms of the advances that they made. To get into the true purpose of history, we begin by quoting from Baba Chinwezu, one of my favorites, political scientists. Yes. In one of my favorite books, I read this book when I was a teenager, I believe in it. I come back to it regular because, you know, it definitely grounded me in terms of my political development. Says the possibility of history providing cultural therapy for development has been remarked on upon by Joseph Caserbo, a historian from Burkina Faso. Quote. History can play the same role as the psychoanalyst. As long as we don't know how to explain certain events, certain behavior which still exists today in the individual and collective planes, we will remain prisoners of our past because we don't understand it. It's important. Normally we say that, uh, they, they tell us that uh, it is a study of history, yes, that keeps us locked in our past trapped in, our, uh, in, in the past. Baba Kizerbo is saying to us that not knowing our history and not understanding our history, yes, is actually what keeps us prisoners to our past. He says, if one doesn't understand his history, even his own private history, he can cultivate complexes, believing, for example, that one is damned, cursed, condemned. History allows us to understand who we are. If one doesn't know who one is, one can't know what one wants to become. I think that almost the exclusive role of history is to lay down this fundamental base for development. Following the line of thought expressed above, I have come to believe that our past, by the tasks it implicitly sets for us, is a compass to our future. That compass has come up again. Baba Chinwezu reignites the symbolism of the compass. That a map of our past is the pathfinder to our destiny. Thus, if we misread the map or consult an incorrect map, we will misdirect our efforts in shaping our future. Mama Marimba Ali teaches us, gives us the Ma'at Ma'afa Sankofa model. Ma'afa being the invasion, conquest, enslavement, colonization, and neocolonization of African, African people. I say ma'at ma'afa. Ma'afa being the, in all of what I just said, yes? Ma'at being who we are originally according to our essence. Isfet being the condition that we have been subjected to as a result of being taken through ma'afa. Sankofa, the process that we must take ourselves through if, to, if we are to restore ourselves to Ma'at, Ma'at, the ancient Kemetu principle of truth, justice, righteousness, harmony, balance, reciprocity, and order. Ma'at representing us according to who we are by nature prior to invasion, conquest, and slavery. We have these images, yeah, to just give us a brief explanation of depiction of some of the things that have taken place the image that you see on your far left is 
Africa prior to 1884 and 1885, the Berlin Conference, during which European nations sat around the table and carved up Africa to consolidate yeah, their colonization of the African continent. The image that you see in the middle is Africa after uh, 1884, 1885, the Berlin Conference, after they had gone through that process. And as you can see, the different territories are coded according to which European, yes, governs the territory. And then uh, what you see on your, on your right is more or less, yeah, with a few additions, more or less Africa as we know it today. Yes, still perpetuating the legacy of, of the Berlin Conference. Our borders were drawn up by these Europeans at the Berlin Conference. And we have, for some reason, decided to haul on upon them. Yes. For some reason. All right. So. Today. Yeah. As far as Ma'afa is concerned. We are in what Papa Kwame Nkrumah defined as neocolonialism. Neocolonialism, he says, is the essence of neocolonialism is that the state which is subject to it is in theory independent and has all the outward trappings of international sovereignty. In reality, its economic system and thus its political policy is directed from outside. And so when Africans like Osaja Fakwami and Kruma, Sekatore, yeah, uh, Dedan Kimati, Queen Mama Nomzama Madikizela Winnie Mandela, uh, Modibo Keita, and others were pushing P P Papa Patrice Lumumba, uh, uh, Samora Michelle, Justina Michelle, yeah, and many others were pushing towards African liberation. What happened was, as I said before, the forces of European and Western imperialism recalibrated in what was called and developed what is referred to as the Bretton Woods institutions. The IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, yeah, etc., and the United Nations. And because African nations had been subject to significant periods of underdevelopment, When we became independent, we were not at a, an equilibrium with the rest of the world. We were, in fact, had been underdeveloped. So we were having to play catch up with the rest of the world. The infrastructure, the education, yes, the institutions that we needed to be able to develop ourselves were yet to be built. And whilst we were in the process of building them, an attack came from Britain and America, the United Nations, France. And leaders such as Kwame Nkrumah were overthrown. Leaders such as Mondibo Keita were assassinated. Leaders such as Patrice Lumumba were assassinated. And when Patrice Lumumba was assassinated, those who were loyal to the vision, yes, that he was leading in the nations of Congo, picked up arms in a Simba rebellion led by a man by the name of Pierre Molele. Yes. Hail up his queen, Leone Abo Molele, who's still alive. And they waged a revolutionary war against the brutal regime of Joseph Mobutu. And Joseph Mobutu in the Congo, who was responsible in part for the assassination of Papa Patrice Lumumba, and was installed by the, by, by the French and the Americans to preside over a neo-colonial state. When this rebellion was in progress, the Americans and the French funded Mobutu to squash the rebellion, capture P Pierre Molele and various other leaders, 
and assassinate them in the most brutal fashion. Time doesn't allow to go fully into the history. But there were many assassination attempts, many coups, yes, and actual assassination that took place between the 1960s and the 1980s. Which led us to the condition of being in an unfinished revolution. What were they fighting for? Yeah. Uh, a few examples of this can be found in the book by the name of Africa Must Unite, as written by Osage for Kwame Nkrumah. And he was trying to develop what he referred to as a union of African states. He understood that Africa and African peoples were not going to be able to withstand the onslaught from the former colonizers as little individual nation states played off against each other. That we, in as much as these European nation states acted in collaboration with each other, yes, when they come to oppress, we had to act in unison with, with each other in order to throw off the shackles of oppression. And so some of the things that were on the table that they were trying to institute, yes, was, as he says, the union's activity shall be exercised mainly in the following fields. A, domestic policy, working through a common orientation of the states, meaning we must have a shared goal. Yes. B, foreign policy, the strict observance of a concerted diplomacy calculated to achieve closer cooperation. When we speak to the rest of the world, we speak as one voice based upon our common objectives. This was important. Why? Because one of the things that became a, a reality is that because during colonization, uh, the Europeans developed what they call cash crop economies, whereby they developed infrastructure to export African natural resources, yes, for the sake of uh, development in European economies. Very little seems to have changed, right? But because of the fact that, uh, for example, if we take uh, a nation like Ghana and a nation like Burkina Faso and a nation like Ivory Coast, all of which are cocoa producing nations yeah and so because these europeans yeah are negotiating with ghana as uh an individual nation ivory coast as an individual nation burkina faso as an individual nation this creates competition in the market between those nations who now have to lower their prices in order to maximize yeah, uh, the investment, i.e. how much they are able to sell to the foreign buyer. So in order to get rid of that, yeah, domestic policy and foreign policy means that no, when we sell cocoa, we sell as one nation. Yeah, we set the price. Yeah. And we benefit collectively from the industry. Yes. So that was a goal to, to withstand the intrigue and the divisionary tactics of the neocolonial administrators. Yes. Defense. The organization of a system of joint defense, which will make it possible to mobilize all the means of defense at the disposal of the state in favor of any state of the union, which may become victim to aggression. In other writings, this is referred to as an African high command. Today, we are living in a time of the development, yes, of the American Africa high command on the African continent. America has an Africa high command loyal to the political interests of America currently developing military bases all over the African continent. And this is one of many high commands yeah, that America has. America has basically split up the world and set out its military to police the world in these various different commands. Yes. Now. The interesting 
thing where this is concerned is that the headquarters of AFRICOM is actually in Germany. Mm. So we see that Europeans are still working in collaboration with each other. <laughs> yeah, in this regard. And so in order to withstand that, we need to have an Africa high command to protect ourselves. Yeah. Now bear in mind that the Africa high command is being instituted at the same time as the African free trade area. Yes. And the integration, the regional integrations of African economies, these interests on the face of it would would appear to conflict. How is it that America has is increasing a military presence in the African continent at the same time as Africans are said to be going through the Africa rising period? Yeah? And integrating our economies as a result. There's a relationship between military and economy. In the sense of the fact that military war is often a field of activity that is engaged in to protect the economic interest of a nation. So if under the current regime, there is not a conflict between America's high command and Africa's regional and economic integration. It suggests to me, yes, that Africa's economic integration as it stands right about now is serving the same goal as the military interest of the United States of America. In order to withstand that, we have to have our own defense system. D, economy, defining a common set of directives relating to economic planning, aiming at the complete uh, decolonization of setups inherited from the colonial system and organizing the development of the wealth of their countries in the interest of their peoples. I'm going to come back to that. Finally, culture, the rehabilitation and development of African culture and frequent um, and diversified cultural exchange. So this is setting the, 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 um, the scene for the problems that they were trying to solve then, yes? Um, and the fact that they have not been solved today. These problems have not been solved today, yes? So when we get back to history providing us with the roadmap, we know clearly what problems have not been solved uh, as yet i'm going to skip this slide for the sake of time all right now at the moment yeah there's a bit of a petrol crisis going on in the uk as a result of a thing called brexit and as i said many times one of the things that interested me most during the brexit debates and the brexit vote was that one of the things that was said many many times is that The, U the European Union had presided over the longest period of peace, yeah, in the history of Europe, yeah, that these people had not had a period longer than 70 years where they had not had a significant war among them one another. So that made me understand that within the context of this Brexit situation, Britain in particular and Europe in general is still trying to solve the problems of mass European War II. Misnomered World War II. That's what, they, that's what they're doing. That their history dictates that we have to develop institutions that lessen, yes, the possibility of us going to war with each other. Nations that trade and are politically engaged and intertwined are less likely to go to war. Okay. But now our goals and our aspiration, our development as African people is being defined by loans 
that were given to us in Africa and the Caribbean by the institutions that Europeans developed after mass European war too. So they're defining their own agenda and our agenda. We're not talking about the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is linked up with the total liberation of African content anymore. We're talking about development and Africa rising, etc., etc., etc. And one of the main ways that we are being indoctrinated into this kind of psychology as African people living in Britain today is through greater association and identification with the British identity. And this is on this is this is the real pandemic right about now, especially with young Africans, especially in relation to the English football team. Now last year and the year before, um, because it was a, it was the what the World Cup year a few years ago, and it was the first time you know, that they had diversity, right? Significant diversity, noticeable di diversity within the English football team, and a lot of Africans, yeah, uh, were rallying around, yeah, the English football team during this period for that reason, yeah. This dynamic has only increased, yeah, in this year with the euros yeah the european tournament so not only were more and more africans supporting the england football team whereas previous generations it was sacrilege to support the england football team yeah sacrilege for africans in the uk to support the england football team or the england cricket team in particular now more and more africans because we're identifying with what it means to be British and English are supporting the English football team. And in the previous edition of the presentation, I shared an article from historian David Olusoga, who says in so many words that this celebration of the England football team and support of the England football team is predicated upon the fact that the younger generation do not know what many of the older generations went through in this country, particularly as related to the symbols of the British flag and the English flag. The younger generation don't know about the teddy boys and the skinheads that their grandparents had to fight every day on the street. They don't know about the NF, the National Front, and the British National Party that their parents had to fight on the streets. They don't know that these symbols, these flags, were symbols of white racism to previous generations. And so our celebration and embrace, yes, of the national pride of the English football team requires a loss of collective memory in the intergenerational sense. And this was accelerated this year by the fact that uh, one of the illustrious groups, yeah, of the current generation of artists in the UK, Crepton Conan, were commissioned to do the song or a song for the Euros, yeah, to represent the England team uh, in the Euros. And there was a documentary about their journey creating this song. And as a part of that journey, they met with the England manager, Gareth Southgate. And so we're going to take a snippet uh, out of this particular documentary, yeah, and listen carefully to the dynamics of the conversation between Gareth Southgate and Krypton Conan. Got a fast forward look a piece. Yeah, it's yeah. Change. What's, What's important, important to you? Uh, so, so I was 25, 25 when I first, when I first got, got the call. call. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. How, how no, I was gonna play. I, I was gonna play the whole thing. Yeah. How you doing? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. Great. You okay? You okay? Nice to meet you, man. So, which part of London are you guys? Palace. Palace. Yeah, I played to Palace. That's where I started. Yeah. So, that's local. Yes. How are you feeling about the team this this year? Yeah, I think like everybody else, we're as excited when we're coaching them as as supporters are to watch them. How did it feel when you got the call up? Uh, What's that feeling? Like? So that I was 25 
when I first got the call. But I remember going to my room in the hotel and all his training kit was in the room. So I just remember standing in front of the mirror and putting it on and looking at the badge and looking at myself in the badge. And, and of course, you think about everybody that's helped you on the way. And mm. yeah, it's a special feeling because very few people get the chance to represent their country at anything. So it's, mm, it's, it's, the, it's the biggest thing you can do. What's important to you when you watch an England team? For me, watching an England match and seeing the change in terms of the diversity like now, for me, is just like yeah, big change. Like it's not quite correct to say we represent it's everybody everything. yet in, yeah, but you... uh, on the field. But what I notice is off the field, the supporters that come to the games, that's very different. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah definitely. You know, and if even if we travel, um, the fans, fans that come up to me are from every community. And that's really powerful because it does feel as if people are, are feeling a connection with the team. And yeah. That's what we're there for. You know, the national team is something that you hope. Sorry, Kings and Queens. I got a message saying that it's lagging. Is that the case? Uh, are you able to watch the video clearly? Um, if not, I'll try to, um, to get it to you for another means. So just let me know before I continue if the video is lagging or not. Um, yeah, just let me know if it's lagging, that like you can watch it clearly. Um, before I continue, yeah. Um, so I, I hope you are pre in the com in the meantime, I hope you are pre in the conversation and listening to the, the dynamics here, yeah. And an and important, okay. So big up my brother, my brother Bunya, um, who's over there in Gambia right about now. All right, so Goku, your thing might be um, true to your own connection, student. So you, you have a super say in your connection. You know what I'm saying? Um, you might have a super say in your connection, all right? Um, all right, so we're going to continue because it, it said that it's lagging a little piece, but you can hear it clearly, yeah? So let, let's go forward. A, an important question is about to be asked, yeah? So the, check, stay tuned. Connects, Connects with everybody. As you know, as you know where... where. Here to, to um, do the Euros anthem. anthem. I'm honoured that, that you want an old fogey like me to fly a pass. What would you say we should apply on you know, this record that we're trying to make? I would say, say um, you, you shouldn't worry about what's been important in the past. To be English now is different, I think. You know our team is more diverse, our culture is more diverse. What will appeal to the audience you're seeking is different to yeah, what it was back, what it was back then. So go for it. Do, do, do what you believe it represents the team now. <coughs> All right, so you lot heard that, yeah? Yeah, you lot heard that, right? So basically, don't focus on what Britain and England represented before. Do away with that. Yeah, do away with that. Focus on today, the diversity. Yeah, and and so on and so forth. the same message, right? But let's take a look at exactly what Britain represents to us today. So some of you may have seen this clip going around. Yeah, uh, and I'm not even going to talk. I'm just going to play it. Yeah, um, and explain it afterwards. All right, turn down more. Benin. A kingdom which is determined to own its past. Nigerians say when their looted bronzes are returned, some will be loaned back. So scholars in Britain and Europe and America can continue to admire them. But for many people... I've just realised, some, some of these does require some explanation, right? So in 1897, when Britain was on the verge yeah, of, um, of colonising uh, significant parts of West Africa, um, it invaded the kingdom and the empire of Benin. Yeah. Sat the kingdom Bondong, the Great Benin Walls, yeah, which is in the Guinness Book of Records as the largest earthworks ever in human creation. That's a good piece of history right there. Yeah. You can Google that. One of the things that took place, though, is that they looted, yes, thousands of art pieces known collectively as the Benin Bronzes. Yeah. Many of the best pieces of which. Uh, reside in the British Museum. I, I, I heard a startling statistic the other day, you know, that France actually has 90,000 bedding bronzes, yeah, 
in France, in, in museums all over France right about now. Yeah. And so this is a, a, a Channel 4 news piece in relation to the Benin bronzes and the fact that the people of Benin City, yeah, where the things them come from, have been petitioning for the return of the Benin bronzes um, for quite some time. All right. And like I said, some of you may have seen this video going around, but we'll, we'll, we'll take it um, in now. Benin, Benin a, kingdom a kingdom which is, which is determined, determined to own its past. Nigerians say when their looted bronzes are returned, some will be loaned back. So scholars in Britain and Europe and America can continue to admire them. But for many people here, ownership, ownership is non-negotiable. Well, earlier I spoke to the Culture Secretary, Oliver Dowden, and I began by asking him whether he thought the stolen Benin bronzes should be owned by Nigeria. Well, I think that they properly reside in the British Museum. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't work uh, with the, the government in Nigeria uh, to see how we can um, for, for, share it with them. For, for, forgive me, yeah. and I understand um, sharing, but they were stolen. Do you not think that they should be owned by the people that they were stolen from in the first place? Well, I think the, the problem with this, and of course, um, if we go back to things that happened in the, the, the 19th century mm. and judge them by uh, our values of today, it's completely uh, unacceptable. But uh, my concern about this is, where do you actually draw the, the, the line with this? The collections of our great national institutions have been developed over many, many centuries, in many times in uh, questionable uh, circumstances. I think the question now is about what we do with these. Mm. I love the Benin uh, bronzes. I've seen them many times throughout my life. And I think them being in the British Museum, uh, which is a world repository of heritage, allows people to see it. But that doesn't stop Understood. us from, oh, from, oh, from sharing it. OK, but ownership is key, right? Yeah. And the Nigerians say, the Nigerians say that if when they get them back, they would almost certainly be happy to loan them back to you. But the fundamental problem is that they were stolen from the Nigerians and they want to own them. I completely accept that they were acquired at a time of um, rampant uh, uh, colonial expansion in, um, in, in Africa, in circumstances that I'm not in any way going to sort of uh, defend or condemn with the values of the, the, the 21st century. I think, though, the more important question is uh, how we ensure that the world can uh, enjoy this this marvellous heritage. A letter will soon be sent, mandated under international law by the Nigerian government to the British Museum, formally requesting return. You and I know that that would also require uh, laws, the Heritage Act and the British Museum Act, to be revoked or at least amended. Is that a realistic prospect? Uh, no, we have no plans uh, for, for doing that. OK, let me just... All right, so you, you see who are going there, so kings and queens. Yeah, this is these are artifacts that are important to our history as African people. And whilst we, yeah, are engaged in the euphoria of Britishness and feeling like we can, we can be English now, this is how the British state, yes, relates to us as a people and our people outside of the country. They feel, they still feel that they have the right of ownership of the history of African people, very literally. Yes? If we ever wanted to know where we are at with the reparations movement, kings and queens, yeah? Those who are overly obsessed with appealing to the moral sensibilities of Western institutions of white people in relation to reparations this interaction should tell us all that we need to know but the reality is that the unfinished revolution means that nigeria because this is not the, the requesting us so far haven't come from the nigerian government they've come from the the the, the oba of benin which is a province within nigeria remnants of the empire of Benin. But the reality is that Nigeria is a neo-colonial, the Nigerian government is a neo-colonial institution. So it doesn't have the wherewithal 
to significantly challenge <laughs> the Queen of England and her government in relation to the return of these stolen artifacts. You know, hear what the man said? The man said, I believe them properly belong in the British Museum. And that is to say, that is to say nothing of all of the other artifacts that the British Museum stole, has stolen from uh, our people and our ancestors. I'm, I'm spoken for longer than I intended to already. So let me get through the rest of this very quickly. All right. And I, I may even just chuck some of it off and get to, back to it in, in, in the conversation. Uh, I'm going to skip this entirely and maybe come back to it only because I actually went into this last year. Right. So I'm going to leave that alone and, and, and pick up back here. Papa Garvey says the battles of the future, whether they be physical or mental, will be fought on scientific lines. And the race that is able to produce the highest scientific development is the race that will ultimately rule. So it would make sense for us in terms of the proper understanding of history and understanding even the context of the unfinished revolution to understand that African people have developed scientific development and achievement within the context of our own culture, nations and civilizations. One example of this is provided in the book Blacks and Science, Volume 2, by Robin Walker, where he speaks about metallurgy. And he says metallurgy reached a high point in the 9th century AD, uh, eastern Nigeria, at a civilization archaeologists call Ibo Uku. Yeah, now the Ibo Uku actually begins BC. It's a BC culture that flourished uh, in, in, in the AD period. Yeah. Um, here, Outstanding evidence of leaded bronze art and artifacts were recovered. Leaded bronze is an alloy of copper, tin, leaded, sorry, tin, lead, tin, lead, and silver work together. The splendid artifacts pieces were made using the six stage lost wax technique. Listen carefully. The lost wax technique involves one, making a rough clay model of the artifact to be to be made. Two, placing a layer of beeswax over the model with all the fine and intricate details, perhaps keeping the wax three millimeters thick. Three, placing a second layer of clay over the beeswax. Four, placing everything into a kiln and fire it knowing that the melting point of wax is lower than the melting point of clay. The motor wax runs out leaving a three millimeter gap five pouring molten metals into the mold replacing the lost molten wax six and six waiting for the molten metal to cool and harden into shape followed by removing the layers of clay incidentally this is the same technique used today to make car parts let me read that last sentence again. Incidentally, and I'm, I'm going to do more research on this as well, you know. Incidentally, this is the same technique to use today to make car parts. If Africans in what? The ninth century could pioneer a technique that is being used today to make something of the ubiquitous utility of car parts. What does that say about the capacity of African, of the ingenuity of African culture today? With all of the other advances that scientific and science and technology has made from that time until now. One of the things that we have a problem with is the fact that our economies remain cash crop economies because we are not doing product development and refinement within our nations yeah wherever it is yeah whether it's bauxite in ghana or bauxite in jamaica wherever it's banana yes in congo or it's banana in saint vincent it no matter the companies that run the industry are not our own. 
So if we were doing this over a thousand years ago, what is stopping us from developing the industries to work our own metals into products today? It demonstrates we have the capacity and our unfinished revolution provides us with the context and, and the necessity for achieving this. Similar On a similar vein, when it comes to science, yeah, we have the Akosomba Dam project, yeah, which was uh, something that was being instituted by the Assessor for Kwame Nkrumah for the purpose of providing um, domestic and industrial energy Yes, for Ghana and significant portions of West Africa. And this energy generation would have fueled industries associated with gold, diamond, bauxite, manganese, timber, rubber, cocoa, cassava, fruits, palm oil. Energy sources are the primary factor in developing an industrialized economy. However, had it not been for the machinations of the forces of white supremacy and their collaborators in our midst who destroyed the development of this program, not only would the program have been able to achieve this, but West Africa, a gener two, three generations ago, would have been the first nation or group of nations whose economies was fueled to a significant degree or primarily by a renewable energy source. There is no nation on the planet today that powers its energy primarily from renewable sources or now that has not been achieved. Yeah, or now that has not been achieved. Are we saying the Osajifu was perfect? No. Are we saying even the Akosomba Dam project was perfect? No. What we are saying is, this was the road that we were on during this era, the same era of the post-World War II, quote-unquote, the development of all these UN and WTO and WHO and IMF and what, the same era, this is what we were on. But this was reversed. Why? Yes? So it gives us the mission. This is what we still are yet to achieve. So we need to pick up back the blueprints. Improve. Improve. The imperfections. And fulfill the mission. I'm just leaving this here. Because I could run off all the achievements of, of um, Baba Thomas Sankara. Is he significant because there is currently a court case in process relating to his assassination? Won't go into that because of time. But I want to highlight the fact that under his government, the nation of Burkina Faso was productive enough to become food self-sufficient in the space of four years. There is barely a nation in Africa and the Caribbean that is food self-sufficient today. Some say Ethiopia may have just achieved it. I'm not sure if that's still the case, especially with what's going on in Ethiopia right about now. Some say e Eritrea uh, achieved it a few years ago. Zimbabwe are uh, even in spite of uh, economic sanctions and a drought was able to feed its nation. Yeah? Um, some years ago. But as on the whole, kings and queens, even with those examples, questionable as they are, yeah, we cannot say be said to be existing in a state of food self-sufficiency right now as African people. It takes agricultural genius and economic genius to achieve something like that, to make a nation food self-sufficient, yeah, in four years, kings and queens. So I want to highlight that. Yeah. So again, we're, we're being presented with the mission. This is the compass. This is the map. This is the clock that we need to tell us our political and cultural and economic time of day. Apologies. In fact, let me just...
correct this for a second because you're not going to be able to fact. I'll just read it, cha. Taken from the book Reinventing Africa, Matriarchy, Religion and Culture, one of the things that Baba Thomas Sankara was known for is his impact upon the issue of the women in society. And Thomas Sankara was really playing on some of ancient African traditions when he was engaged in this work. In this book, yeah, uh, Elder Ifi Amaduimi says, speaks to the traditional power of women in African society. And she says the traditional power of African women had an economic and an ideological basis which derived from the importance accorded motherhood. I have argued that this issue of the structural status of motherhood is the main difference between the historical experiences of African women and those of European women. This is directly linked to the histories of the family in these different systems. Frederick Engels, you know, the great, uh, uh, I was going to say the great Marxist, but <laughs> the great communist, yeah, uh, uh, theoretician, yeah, argued that the European patriarchal family has been the root and seat of women's oppression. I believe that it is this that it also explains why European women never achieved women's organizations and self-government as African women did. She goes on a different part of the book. Oh. One second, kings and queens. Right. Okay, that's what it was. This was the background of to the women's economic and political prominence in African history. The economic role was was not confined to the household and why the kin kin uh, corporate units. They managed and controlled a very extensive market network where they were selling and buying. These marketplaces were also social places where outings were held after life cycle ceremonies involving birth, marriage and death. Markets and marketing were not governed by pure profit values, but by the basic need to exchange, redistribute and socialize. That is why traditional African systems were not capitalist economies. They have variously been described as subsistence, communal, and redistribution uh, economies. I'm emphasizing two different things at the same time here. One is the, is the role of the women, and two is the economic system that they governed, that they were responsible for governing. Yes? So we, we are at a point right now whereby we're being taught that we have to import Western feminism in order to address uh, women's uh, empowerment. We're also being taught that we have to in, in, we have to uh, uh, invest in European ideologies, whether they be capitalism or communism, in order to develop economically. Yeah, and I believe, and we are yet as African-centered, inclined people to develop a comprehensive economic theory. But I'm putting this forward because, as we already know. But we have we are yet to consolidate this in terms of and, and make it theoretically functional in today's world. Although many of us are doing that work, you know what I'm saying, in, in different areas. But we can definitely see the, the, the basic principles here that can be extracted in order to develop and evolve an economic system and social order that is able to meet our needs and solve some of those problems that we're having in terms of our social relationships as African men and women uh, in today's world. Um, this, th what I've just read is exemplified by the example of this great woman whose name we very rarely call, uh, who's uh, uh, Nwan Yerua, yeah? who was an Igbo woman who organized over 10,000 women to challenge uh, the colonial regime and its puppets, AKA warrant chiefs, yeah? Um, in 1929, yeah. Uh, another woman who was inspired by her work was Funmilayo Anikolapo Kuti, the mother uh, of Fela Anikolapo Kuti. Going forward and finally, I'm going to end here, yeah. There, there, there is two more slides after this from Nana Amos Wilson, but we're going to leave that for the sake of time, all right. Taken from the book African Cosmology, let's jump in home this point about um, uh, economic systems and learning from our history, yes? In order to set our political and economic trajectory in the present, yeah? He says, um, while after engaging in a, in, a, in a critique of capitalism and communism, Baba Kim Wan Den, the Kiabun Seki Fukiao, yeah? Uh, for, for the Al-Kibbalanites watching, 
uh, this is the same elder who co-wrote the book Kindesi. All right. He says, contrary to capitalism and communism, so socialism, the African Kisinsi, yes, it's the economic system that he's identifying among the Kikonga people, the African Kisinsi is different. The Bantu Congo, Luba, Mongo, uh, Rwanda, uh, Zulu, etc., constitute in their daily life a system. Kimpa, full, which means system, whereby the land, source of happiness and blessing to all terrestrial life, belongs not to individuals, landlords, or to a state, as it respectively exists in the case of capitalistic and communistic systems, but to the essential fundamental community, Kanda, which means community, nation, etc., and all its members, be they poor, rich, scholars, idiots, young, or elder. They all have access to inalienable land. As a Congo proverb says, community land is our life. And I always like to, because Baba Kim one then there, he always, um, he, he uses Kikongo language regularly. So I always like to, to battle and, and, and go through it. So, Ntoto Wakanda, yes, I'm saying Wakanda, Nimoyo Eto. All right. So again, I'm just coming home this point about um, economic systems, kings and queens. And at the moment, we have an issue whereby, yeah, for example, in a place like Jamaica, yeah, there are people that have struggled to access land, partly because there is a significant amount of land in Jamaica that is still considered crown land, owned by the monarch of England. Can you believe it? In 2021 Jamaica But why is that the case? Because the Queen of England Is still the head of state Kings and queens The Queen of England remains The head of state And so I'm using Gone through this rather disjointed Set of examples Just to give a signpost For how we can use our history As guides As a compass As our clock And as our roadmap for solving some of the problems that we need to solve as African people in today's world. The key challenge that we have right now is developing children who are fit and equipped to meet those challenges and have the desire and the conviction to do so. For the sake of time, I'm going to end uh, the presentation there and open up for discussion. Uh, give thanks, brothers and sisters. Tenna Mwari. Kendan Mwari, Brother um, Tafatwa, brilliant presentation. I'm sure all our viewers uh, will agree. Um, just to, um, to, to kick off, um, because I'm sure brothers and sisters will come in with, um, with, with um, their ideas and their questions and their suggestions. But let me just sort of uh, kick off with something, with a thought that I've got in mind. Um, when you looked at Baba um, Carter G. Woodson, you talked about him way back then developing um, material resources that um, he made available to to schools, you know, um, for our children to learn about our history, our culture, etc. And these materials were not just for children but for adults as well. Um, when you consider that in the UK, we don't have a, have a central uh, institution or organization that represents us nationally, how do we then go about making sure that we have materials that we can get into the institutions that you could say represents or comes from our community? And this is the type of things that we would like the schools to address so for example some of the basics that they should teach would be they should at least know about the founder of black history month they should at yes, least know about the people who brought black history um month to the uk and some of the aims and objectives of um you know of why they brought black history month to the uk and why actually black history month was developed in the first place we don't you think we should have some some key things 
that schools should be able to teach our children in school. Otherwise, yes, it's not Black History Month they're teaching. What do you say, um, um, brother? Um, most, most definitely, Antemitai. It's a, it's an excellent question. Uh, oh, I, I should say that the, the link is in the chat, family. So if anybody wants to come on, like I said, ask, ask a question, add to the knowledge that that has been shared, uh, or even challenge, challenge anything that has been said, shared. Please do click the link, um, and and make, make we talk. Um. Yeah, so I'll tell you that it's a beautiful question to me. So there, obviously, as as you know, there, there there are people doing this work um, who go into schools and you know what I'm saying teach about Black History Month and Carter G. Woods and them kind of things. There, there is no problem that is not going to be solved that that cannot be solved through greater organization, and that's the long and short of it. Yeah, almost <laughs> almost any question that we ask, the answer is going to be organization in some way, shape, or form. I think what probably needs to happen. Okay, I, 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 this we, one of the things that that that. Because uh, this is a, a problem that we don't that we don't need to wait to have an all-encompassing national body to solve, if that makes sense. And in fact, solving it may actually assist us in actually getting or developing that national body that we're talking about. Yeah. In the sense of the fact that we have brothers and sisters out here who regularly go into schools, yeah, um, and, and do work with young people. In er on areas like history, especially during Black History Month, yeah, and so it would take for those people who are doing that work and doing that work every day uh, to organize ourselves in terms of unifying and consolidating our efforts, yeah, and producing those materials and market marketing it uh, to schools. Um, you know, it would take for our Saturday schools yeah, to be involved in that process because the Saturday schools are already doing that work, right? This, this is what I'm saying with the, with the students that are there, and so there, there there is there is some institution that develops out of that that is producing these materials, and based upon the force of our numbers, is able to have the kind of impact that we would that we would like to have. Um, that is one answer, um, and it's not the only one, but that's one answer to that question, and I hope that that addresses it. Yes, yes, and I'm worried. Um, has, has any questions come in yet? Um, Heru asked, What page is the Fukia quote from? It might, off the top of my head, it's in the, it's in the 70s, you know. Um, if I can locate the book, one second. Um, da -da 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 Social organization. Yeah, sorry, I, I should I should have put the, the um the page number there. I usually do. African Masters for today. Um apologies, kings and queens. Crowns in the land. Ah, there we go. Yeah, 77. Yeah, so the well well read well, it begins on 77 and it goes forward, yeah. So exactly what I read is probably on 78 or 79, but but read from 77 basically and under the um uh the heading to misrepresent uh the Kim Vuka is a political crime. Yeah. To misrepresent and in fact the, the subheading from before that on page 75 crimes concerning land is actually the, the best place to start yeah crimes concerning land is the best place to start where that is concerned all right um uh, we've got somebody in the back here who wants to come on and um and interact so i'm gonna let them through you could do the same kings and queens by by hitting the the link in the ch in the chat um and coming through asking your questions and your comments or sorry asking your questions and making your comments brother coffee Oh, one yeah, second. I mean, we've, we've, got, we've got Bunya here as well. Greetings, Bunya, over there in Gambia. Greetings, everyone. Greetings. Greetings, yeah, man, greetings. greetings. All right, so go, go ahead, Coffee. Yeah, um, greetings, everyone. You know, um, interesting presentation, informative, and, you know, historical and contemporary at the same time. Um. The, the, you mentioned in the beginning um, the idea or the concept of a collective historical memory bank, right? Yes, sir. Um, 
I don't know. This may be similar to, to um, Carl Jung and his collective consciousness, or his idea of this collective consciousness, which is you know very popular among certain certain philosophies and stuff. But you know, it is it in fact problematic. Is there such a thing as a collective consciousness? Because yeah, the, the the very yeah the very the very notion that we all have a collective memory bank might be a little bit, you know, um, problematic given the fact that, you know, we all have our own individual minds, biases, ideologies, experiences, lived experiences, you know. Um, so how useful, I should say, how useful is it to talk about a collective uh, memory bank? especially in the light of the fact that your own presentation kind of um, lumped up a lot of historical figures, male and female, um, without even contextualizing the, the, the serious ideological and philosophical differences between them, you know what I mean? I mean, how useful is it to talk about a Marcus Gavin or Thomas Sakar or Nkrumah or Cabral without pointing out crucial differences that may may have serious implications in terms of how we move forward as a as a people or even can we even um talk about moving forward in one voice so it's a good question the the, the I'll take your, your last part first yeah um the, this was not the presentation to explore the differences between um Garvey and Nkrumah or Garvey and Sankara or even Sankara and Nkrumah uh Nkrumah and and and, and um Mwalimu Baruti um sorry Mwalimu Julius Nerede yeah that they all had their differences right the point is that was being made is that whatever their differences they they represent a movement and various iterations of a movement that was concerned with the liberation of african people yeah that was their express goal and they went about it in different ways and they have their nuances there the debate between them is something that we can resolve in our activity when we're engaging with the solving of the problems that they were trying to solve if we're not trying to do that then it, talking about a difference it doesn't make any sense yeah it's a it's an exercise in futility and intellectual masturbation yeah in that regard um and so within the context of this presentation it's aligning us with the historical moment yeah and the historical mission um and once we're aligned with that, then we will naturally engage the different philosophies and, and the different strategies, the different tactics, the different um, institutions, what worked, what didn't work, and why uh, it worked and, and didn't work, and so on and so forth. To the first part of, of, of your um, question, collective consciousness, consciousness yeah. abounds in all human relations there are no nations without collective consciousness there are no ethnicities without um collective consciousness there are no multinational corporations and institutions without collective consciousness um at the moment um we exist in the context of the hegemony the global hegemony of uh the the the, the, the conceptual west the west is a framework that is designed to identify a specific uh what collective consciousness of people that derive <clears throat> and trace their historical and cultural lineage back to greece and rome yeah that is what it is designed to do greece and rome as it manifested in western europe yeah as opposed to eastern europe because even in eastern europe you still got the greco-roman influence as far as russia is concerned and 
uh, Eastern Germany and blah 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 blah, so on and so forth. Yeah. All right. Well, the, so they, they don't they don't America, operate. No. They, they, they they promote the concept of individualism, and but the fact is that individualism, ironically, as in their culture, is actually an expression of their collective consciousness. Okay. Um, the mere fact that you and I disagree on interpretation of history proves that there's no such thing as collective collective consciousness um and the reason why i brought up the topic of the differences between no 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 no, no 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 let's explain that because because we disagree disagreement is not that doesn't mean that there's, that there's not a collective I was going to, yeah i was going to explain that uh, yeah no. um the, yeah the reason why i bring it up um you know is not to is not to troll you guys or to throw throw um a wrench in whatever you know but just to 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 try to see clarity because remember the whole idea of black history month and black history in general is to look back as uh, as or to look back and see how we can anchor um ourselves and and move forward right history is not just some kind of intellectual exercise it's it's it's, it's political to use to use that term so when we talk about history we talk about um using history in other words, to move forward, and we only can move forward if we have some kind of clarity instead of the the confusion. So, um, yeah. the the division um, within um, the black race between those who the, 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 those who take a more socialistic path and those who take a more capitalistic path is proof that there is no such thing as a collective consciousness. This division is not unique to African people. It is going on today in Europe and it is going on in America today. The, 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 the back and forth between Democrats and the Republicans and the, the, the fierce culture war in America, right, is proof that these, these issues are not unique to African people or African issues. But they are unique to, to, to human beings and how oh, we, we seek to to, to live together, right, without um, killing each other and stealing from each other. In other words, how do we move from a state of nature to a, to a state of civilization where you respect me and I respect you. I respect, I recognize your humanity and you recognize my humanity, right? And I'm saying that the, the only way that we can develop that kind of um, social contract, quote unquote, for want, for want of a better term, right? The only way we can develop that social contract is if I recognize you as an individual and you recognize me as an individual and we both have freedoms and we, 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 we seek to define what freedom means, right? Does freedom mean that I have the freedom to do what I want as long as I don't infringe upon your rights and you the same? Or does freedom mean that uh, a sovereign, a king, or a dictator, or a majority gets to tell the minority or the individual what to do, how to live, what to produce? It? When we answer those questions, we invariably go into questions of economics, whether we're moving towards a more free market oriented economy are moving to a more socialistic e economy. Whether we call the socialistic economy Ubuntu or Kishinte or Jama or Kibbutz or conscientiousism, right? It all boils down to how we organize economically. How um, humans organize the means of their production constitutes the fundamental relations of society. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna respond and then I feel I tell that we should let Bunya in and then we can because what coffee you can stay there just but it's gonna let, it's just spread spread the love you know what I'm saying um okay. the, the, the 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 irony yeah. of what you're saying is that the words that you're using um implicitly denote collective consciousness um politics there is no politics about collective consciousness. Yeah, there is no economics about collective consciousness because politics and economics can only operate within systems of human relationship. Where there are Wait, systems, all are there, all are there. Where there, where there, where there are systems, there exists collective consciousness. Yeah, 
Um, even in the example that you gave, well, maybe it should be fine. Sorry, sure. sorry, sorry. E even in the example that you gave, the idea that private, sorry, that individuals relate to each other and form contracts, that that principle for it to work has to make up a collective consciousness whereby the individuals agree to relate in that kind of way. Yeah, and all of the and then all of their subsequent yeah. agreements at yeah. that point are also reflections of a collective consciousness. So because yeah. of the fact that once again, in 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 the, in the sense of the fact that there is history. And we have groups of people. History is created by groups of people relating to each other. And throughout history, yeah, that's why you have the history of the Vikings and the history of, 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 of the Romans and the history of the Greeks. And as far as African people are concerned, you have the history of the Nile Valley, um, the history of, of, of the Kikongo, the history of the Monomatapa Empire, and so on and so forth. Yeah? Um, and you also and have history of... The peasants, history of the scribes, history of the fear of course. Yeah, so with, within that, and small of histories. course. I, mean, I don't want to get all postmodern. But, that's, and but, poor, but, but all of that, but all of that is not just empires and that, kings and queens. But, but no, I, I'm, I agree with you. That, that, that's the part I tried to make. All of that okay. is within the context of human beings relating to each other, yes, through system, like. Even when you're talking about the, the concept of peasants and so on and so on, and I, I take your correction well. It's, it's, a, it's an argument that I, that I often make in terms of the fact that we shouldn't just focus on kings and queens. But the concept of a peasant is only relevant within a certain um, social order that designates this role, yes, within society. That is a collective consciousness. Even the idea of a peasant is a collective consciousness. So, so okay. So the mere fact that people may disagree on um, the whole how, how society should be organized, um, whether whether collectively or on individual rights basis, the fact that that disagreement exists does not negate the fact of a collective consciousness. No. For example, in 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 so, in a, so why would in it be collective in the first place? Well, I'll give you an example. So I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to understand. It, um, uh, what can, would can you I can I we, We'd like because other people, you know, would like to come into the, the okay. discussion. If we can get Brother Shakara just to address this last point, and then we move on to okay. um, Brother yeah. Bonia. Can I worry? Right. Uh, 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 it's a it's a very brief example. The the, the, the in I'm in the UK. The Labour Party and the Conservative Party um, disagree on many things in terms of how to run the country one of the things that they don't seem to disagree on though um is is uh foreign military intervention um and multinational corporation that teeth resources they will seem to agree on that i with the, the, the yeah, labor party for example with that. The, sorry the, the labor party throughout history has not been any less colonial um than the conservative party despite their disagreements right what they so what what their, their disagreements take place within a framework within a national framework of a collective consciousness which is british what it means to be british yes um and and so on and so forth all cultures have um have areas no culture could evolve if there wasn't disagreements yeah with it among the members and the various different forces within that culture that's natural that makes sense but within Agreed, the yeah. context of right but within the context of this society for example like i was giving the example before they like to use your example in terms of collective or individuals um, capitalist or socialist and whatever the, the labor party may claim to be more socialist but they're not socialist they're still holding on to a capitalist um, uh, um economic <laughs> ideal right and and, and within and we, one second and, and within and within the um the political spectrum of the country there there are certain things that are not allowed to be on the mainstream of the ballot so you're not you're not going to get no um far left um uh uh, uh hardcore uh, Marxist, yeah, dominating the Labour Party. It's not going you to don't happen. Have to be, you, you don't have to be Marxist yeah, to be hard left. The the, the Labour Party and the Conservative I, I, I Party. I didn't say you did. I didn't, I, did, I, didn't say, I didn't say you did. I was okay. given. I was given an example. What okay, my point but, is that even within their disagreements, they, 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 they there's a spectrum that they accept and don't accept. Yeah, you see what I'm saying that makes them who they are. As far as we as African people are concerned, I I've never come across uh, a, a debate as in us. Uh, what's the word in our indigenous societies about whether we collectively 
we we should um whether people should have access to land or not whether land should be owned by the community or not this is not something that i've ever come across yeah so maybe that's not okay. our debate right maybe, maybe that's right. a principle that we live by yeah do you know what i'm no. saying um but, but i've never i've never come across that ignoring okay, the then, centrality um, of of land and and how land should be distributed uh, you can't really extrapolate from that and say um it's not an issue so okay, brother, uh, based on what you're saying is that even though oh, europeans would kill each other in world war one world war two etc they still they still have a collective consciousness even though human yeah. beings can we kill each other collective yeah, consciousness yeah definitely is still um definitely we, yeah we, really we have right. got brother bunia waiting and we don't want to lose this internet yeah, connection sorry. before we address him so but brother shakara you want to just make this a last point with no no let let, let 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 the brother come in let, let brother bunia come in okay maybe brother Kofi can can hold on and come back again later okay brother bunia yeah, greetings. Brother Kofi's always got loads to say, so, you know, hang around, Kofi, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, hang around, no. definitely. The last conversation I remember us having, I enjoyed that a lot, man. I think that was after Afri African Liber Liberation Day, I think. Um, oh, yeah, man, respect. Yeah, yeah man, respect, man. Um, so, yeah, I got a bit of a cold, so bear with me as well. If I cut off, I will, I will make my statement or ask my question. Are you, are you get cold in La Gambia? What about it? Are you get cold in La Gambia? Uh, there's, listen, all the bacteria is in the, it's in the sand, man. All of the uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. Go on, go on, you, go on. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, it actually wasn't a question. It was kind of more of a um, talking point. Um, off the back of um, what Angela Moon was, was asking you, Shakara, actually, or response in, in relation to education african set of curriculums that's what i understood it to mm -hmm. be <laughs> um this is something i've mentioned to you i think as well um yeah the uh, uh, as you said i'm in gambia at the moment and the hunger for africa is, is ironic to even say this but the hunger for african-centered curriculum is mm. there um i'm living around a corner from a school at the moment um i think the school if I'm not mistaken, has around 5,000 pupils. I don't know if that's a... Someone who used to go to the school told me that. So let me just assume that that's correct. Um, and, you know, they've got... Um, I was going to try and put on my profile picture, the picture that I took of outside of the school. They've got um, a crest with uh, Amilcar Cabral uh, and others on the crest. Um, and I haven't visited. I haven't been inside the school. And I don't know what the curriculums are constructed of. But um outside outside of that the hunger for not just yeah i will call it african-centered curriculums but also just knowledge about the diaspora the hunger is there you know i see i work with young people um on a daily basis and i don't have enough i don't even have enough knowledge to give them in such a short space of time you know i brought, I brought about 80 books with me and then yamming them up you know um, and so I'm, I'm i'm really saying what to say all the United States are doing this work in the diaspora, those that we have in the UK. Really, there's there's serious opportunity to accelerate the learning and accelerate the um that the the, the deliberate attempts to create a, co a a collective consciousness continent by the engaging with um whether it's school uh, schools or schools that have been uh, started by people that we know of on the continent or uh, organizations that already exist. Um, I know um, my wife is Congolese, and there's a there's a um, near her family home in Kinshasa, and you know they're just waiting for people to come and do things there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more, but it's just a, a, really a call out, really, just so that we put up a Saturday school initiative and those who have curriculums to be delivered. Yeah, there's no excuse or no reason to not. Um, even to to, uh, to uh, a youth population on the continent who are seriously hungry, and if they're not going to eat that, they're going to eat something else, isn't it? Mm. Interesting. Give thanks for that. Give thanks for that. Yeah, man. No, I I I, I feel like again, like what the, the and I, I'm still developing the, yeah this presentation, and it's, there's still things I got to take out of it and edit and them kind of things there. But the whole point that I'm, I'm trying to get at with this is is 
to center us on the unfinished problems, the unfinished um, uh, work of, of our great ancestors, if that makes sense. Um, which is really what the liberation movement is about in the first place anyway, right? Why it's just finding, it's just finding another creative way to do it. And I think that this, this education thing is probably one of the, education and media is probably one of the main ways that we're going to do that in today's world. Um, and so I, I, I appreciate your your um, the the reflection, you know what I'm saying, and 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 a, and a reflection from underground, yeah, um, in Mama Africa as well. You know what I'm saying. I, I got a similar. I was talking to uh, another bridge the other day. And I got a similar one, you know, what I'm saying in relation to J Jamaica um, the other day, and that's, and, and I, I get a similar one in relation to Sierra Leone, you know. So mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of work that we have to do in terms of organizing. Um, uh, around being able to inculcate and inspire inspire this alignment mm. towards solving these problems in our next generation like i think it's like it's it's a life and death issue do you know what i'm saying um at, at the moment yes, so, most definitely so, yeah. i say i, I always forget but my, my cousin is actually a, um my cousin is a principal a school principal in um uh and i think it's in an, in an auto bay where my family's from in jamaica I always forget that. <laughs> so, okay. yeah, in fact, there as well. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Ah, good times. Thanks. Good thanks. Good thanks. Ten, ten, um, uh, very, very um, interesting, um, you know, to, to know um, of the the demand, not just the demand, but, uh, you know, the craving that our people really want to to get to know our culture and our history. And we, we have to find ways, definitely find ways of uh, making sure that this information um, get out to our people. Are there any more um, questions um, or comments, uh, Brother um, Shakara? Uh, I wanted to... No, yeah, I, I, yeah, let, 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 I, unless, sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure if opportunity had come to make a contribution. You're, you're on mute, Uncle. Not really a contribution. I'm, I'm just hoping that we can begin to wind up. I know Brother Kofi's had a lot to say, and I think a lot of the, what he's had to say hasn't really been, I think, for this forum and what we were trying to do. So um, much of this appreciated. I'm hoping Brother Brother Kofi can land and we can maybe continue the discussion on a different platform at a different time. Then that more. Then that more. Yes. That's fine. So yeah, let's, let's do one more, Brother Kofi, and then, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, um... I, I just want to understand the, the connection between the quotation that you had with, with Amos Wilson and um, the, 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 the quote about Kishine, the, the, the African communal land system, Kishine. Kishine. Um, so, so right, the, right. The, the, yeah, what's the, the connection? The, the Amos Wilson quote, which I didn't really read yet, but because you've asked about it, I, I'll take the, I'll steal, I'll steal a moment to, to actually read it. The, 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 the link, I was, this is actually going into a, a next part of the presentation. The, the point that I was going to make here is that, um, well, I, I'll just read it because he, none of Amos Wilson says it better than I would. He says, so science doesn't just pop up because you know science or just because you're some scientific genius. It must be what? Supported. And African science and technology in the hands of African people will not become so until African cultures support that science and until African economic systems can afford to pay for it. And that's why an African who majors in engineering and chemistry must also major in political science and government and economics and other things. That's why an African, as an African, you gotta be much more broadly educated than a European. Because the Europeans have already constructed structured their system economically, socially, and so forth. So therefore, they can send their young in and give them a narrow scientific education. And that's just based purely, sorry, that's just based purely on technique because all the other parts are put together. But in, in nations that are developing, the scientists themselves have to also have a working knowledge of related areas so that they can build a structure necessary for the growth and development of science. So when you go to European institutions where you are just taught chemistry 
alone and maths alone and so forth you still or economics alone or whatever alone you still have not yet become an african scientist you understand and simply because you're sitting in those courses and they're not talking about economics sorry uh, doesn't mean you're getting a necessary and appropriate education an african science class discusses politics and economics along with science and technology you have to understand these kinds of things so i was just it was moving on to the next part of the presentation whereby i'm emphasizing the fact that we have to be multi we have to develop a multidisciplinary approach to our development because our political and social and economic reality is still in the making so we don't have the luxury of, of learning um sorry, sorry subjects um isolated from uh its place in the in the world and the fact that we are at war uh -huh. That, well, all right. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't agree that all this is about the growth and development of science. It has to be the growth and development of people, right? The whole idea of applying science is to improve people's people's well-being and people's material environment. That's right? what he's saying. So, That's what he's saying, though. But he's, he's he's talking in the context. I should yeah. say. He's talking in the context of an education system, yeah. So that's that's why he's focusing right. on the science. But but right. also but also on 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 the last point that you made, that's that's the other thing. Um, in 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 the sense of um, of um of of the of the African center that it is focused on people, um, and 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 that's why that's what community orders do. They focus right. on people and people development. Yes, but but remember, science is about improving on what was before, right? And um, so. When we talk about an economy, um, is communal land ownership an improvement on the land, or can it improve the land compared to other systems, or um, is is a is is a scientific application of knowledge um, yes. um, needed? Um, a scientific application of knowledge means, therefore, that we find other ways for um, land ownership and, and production and exchange as opposed to older systems of communal ownership that didn't exist just in Africa, it also existed in Europe. Remember, the whole idea of even individual rights is not European, because remember in ancient Kemet, you had ideas uh, pertaining to um, rights to property and so on. Remember, the, the Egyptian women who divorced their husbands Right, and you can only divorce your husband if you own your own self, you own your body. Whereas at that time, you know that the, the, the Greco Roman woman was a slave to her husband. So this whole idea of um, individual rights and, and 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 owning your labor, owning your body, and the fruits of your labor, um, to say that this is European is not is not um, accurate. Yeah, that, that I, I'm not sure that was said, but. Uh, and we're probably going to have to have that conversation another time. The what I, what I will respond to though is is this dichotomy between science um, and communal versus individual, and just say that um, the 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 indigenous African societies are do have dominantly engaged in what today is called uh, permaculture whereby you plant different crops on land in order to keep the soil replenished and so on and so forth. This is a site, this is, this, that's, that's scientific agriculture, but that was developed within communal um, systems whereby land was the collective domain of people and people had their custodianship over various different aspects of land and came to market and so on and so on and so forth, right? So we don't have a dichotomy between communal, um, uh, uh, what's the word? uh communal economic systems at least at least in relation to land and scientific application of agricultural principles um as far as our people are concerned so I, I i should say are there... that, so one, one second one second i should say i should say to, to clarify the point i'm trying to make is that to, in today's world the, the western ag agriculture is trying to move more towards per permaculture than horticulture because it is considered to be more sustainable right whereas this is the pervasive agricultural principle within african societies anyway yeah another another aspect of this that that, that we can highlight is this idea and another day we'll go more into this but i'm researching this concept called biomimicry 
yeah, which is developing technology in line with and in imitation of nature, yes, birds and uh, leaves and a lot of these things. But when we look at that, that is a dominant principle within African culture because our spiritual systems are nature based. So we, we mimic That's nature all. anyway. We mimic nature in, in, in everything that we do. But, but Western society is just getting around to this. Why? Because they're concerned about the destruction of the planet. And they realize no, that they... they not... like, one second. No, they realize no. that... Right. Um... But, um, when, you, when you own your own property, private property, you have an incentive not to um, deplete those resources because you'll pay a price. So private property ownership incentivizes um scientific and development and use of the land yeah, preserve that... the land preserve the nature because you as the owner of it um coffee. have an interest you'll pay a price if that coffee. resource is... coffee we got we got we got we got to wrap up here but i'm going to say this in, yeah, man, in, 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 in the last part of what you said and i'm going to wrap up here um the, the scientific development in 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 the societies in which we live today are still majority funded by governments, not private corporations. Yes, that's uh, because they crowd out um, private development. And most of that scientific research is, is bonkers anyway. In other words, if you as a government can crowd out um, private research, then of course you're going to, you have the power to do that because you have a monopoly and use of force. You're the state. So of course you can um, engage in all kind of so-called scientific research. But most of that scientific research is useless. Yes, you'll want, yes, you might have a one off success. But the, the question is had government not crowded out private um, research, what would have happened in the absence of that? Right? There, there, there's, a, there's a lot I could say in response to that, but I know, I know my elders want to wrap up the thing, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to that. Yeah, more respect. Um, yeah. Tender Marty, give thanks for that, Brother Shakura. Uh, give thanks for Shakra for that um, that presentation in that was broad and deep um, and swift as well. Covered a vast range. You want to give thanks for that. Obviously, not everything that was covered could get into in in much depth, but give you thanks in terms of a grounding because there's still, like you said from the outset, uh, a misunderstanding of what Black History Month is supposed to be about, why it was why it was created and what we're supposed to do with it. I think there's enough, hopefully, that people can take away from that. And obviously, those who didn't catch all of it, you can come back to our Kebelan Way, our YouTube channel, and catch the full presentation to watch your leisure again and again and again. And also watch the many hundreds of videos we have on this channel as well. Sisters and brothers, what we're going to do now is move into our clothes. And to do that, we're going to bring forward the spiritual leader of the Al Kebelan Revivalist Movement. He is Brother Leader Bandaka. He's the father of Brother Shakara. He's a, one of the founders of the Akebran Vibrant Movement. He's a spiritual leader. He's an activist of 40 years uh, standing. He's also an African centered education consultant as well. And really an activist of great insight and depth, as you're about to hear. So, sisters and brothers, without any further ado, I'm going to welcome and bring forward our spiritual leader, Brother Leader Bandaka. Tendamwadi, brother leader. And take yourself off mute now, brother leader. It still says you're muted, brother leader. There you go. Tendamwadi. Tendamwadi. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Loud and clear, brother leader. Uh, Tendamwadi. Uh, Tendamwadi. Africa to the God of Africa be the glory. Giving thanks unto Mwari Nyakusika, God the creator of the universe, for all mercies, great and small. And amongst those mercies, we are deeply thankful, grateful, and moved this evening. Uh, for the tour de force that was delivered to us by our brother Shakara, giving thanks and praises 
for the way Muzumumukuru, the great ancestors, have worked through him this evening, giving thanks and praises for the way they have inspired him and directed his research and his energy uh, to bring us the message that he brought us uh, this evening. This was truly a colossus. Uh, we turned up this evening for a presentation on the history of Black History Month. Uh, we, yes, indeed, we did get that, but we got more than the history of Black History Month. We got a history lesson in uh, African, we could say, the African World Revolution. A very important history lesson. And, of course, one that applies itself um, neatly uh, and appropriately to the history of Black History Month. Because when we study... Uh, the key personalities, historical personalities, whose work has brought us uh, to where we are in terms of the evolution of Black History Month, they were all in their own rights revolutionaries. They all had a vision of African world revolution. They all were engaged in building and working within institutions that were designed to empower African people for liberation. They all were ideologically placed in the context of the African Revolution. And so we are reclaiming Black History Month, African History Month, as a tool of revolution. It was established for the purpose of advancing the revolution. And I want to heal um, Brother Shakara for his masterly uh, delivery. Not only what he delivered in terms of his presentation in chief, but in skillfully uh, responding to the questions um, that were raised by uh, members of the gathering. I want to heal him also uh, for the way in which he... His presentation has helped to move us, uh, lift us and move us further towards attaining our collective consciousness. Because without collective consciousness, we don't have the collective mindset to work together for our liberation. Without uh, a collective consciousness, we do not have a frame of reference for our, our history, our identity, and how and where we must go in order to fulfill our vision of total liberation. Without collective consciousness, we can't even communicate. Because it, to, to speak a language in itself is to share a collective consciousness. And so we give thanks and praises that there is a concept of collective consciousness. And the more uh, grounded we are as a people in a collective consciousness, the more uh, we are capable of working together to bring about our liberation. Beloved brothers and sisters, I'd like to share a few thoughts, a few words with you, or just extrapolate some key points from the message that we received this evening. We understand from Brother Shakara's presentation that history is indeed a source of information, but it's not only that. History is indeed a source of inspiration, but it's not only that. History is a source of instruction, but it's not only that. History is also a tool of psychoanalysis, a tool of psychoanalysis, because with history, it helps us to unlock our unconscious thoughts, our unconscious feelings, our unconscious uh, memories, 
our unconscious ideas, our unconscious fears, our unconscious uh, concepts of ourselves. Hi history, as in psychotherapy, helps us to explore our collective past and unlock all of those feelings, all of those emotions, and helps us to understand uh, why we think the way we think in the present, why we are the way we are, collectively as well as individually, and therefore equips us to heal ourselves in mind, in body, and in spirit, and strengthen and fortify ourselves as we move forward uh, with the African world revolution. But history is not only that. History is all of the foregoing. But in addition to that, what was demonstrated to us this evening is that history is a weapon of war. History is a weapon of war. And as we say that, we remind ourselves, as all the experts tell us, that 90% of war is not military. 90% of war is psychological. And the people derive their collective psychology from the history they have of themselves. History will either affirm a people's positive conception of themselves or it will condemn a people to a negative perception of themselves. And when your enemy, when your enemy controls the narrative of your history, the writing of your history, then your enemy writes a history that justifies his conquest over you. This is what we heard this evening. Mm -hmm. And that justification weighs heavily on your self-perception, mm -hmm. our collective self-esteem. And that's why this topic of the history of Black History Month is so important. It is absolutely vital and fundamental that we reclaim Black History Month and the history of Black History Month because there are many myths and misconceptions about why and how we come to celebrate Black History Month and what Black History Month is supposed to mean and how Black History Month is supposed to have come about. So this is a vitally important uh, presentation that we have received this evening. I think most importantly, it is essential that we leave with what I believe is the key message from what we have received this evening. And we can go back to the words of the eminent scholar, warrior scholar Baba John Henry Clark, mm -hmm. who gives us a definition of history. I won't repeat all of it, brothers and sisters, but I'll repeat the last part of that definition because I believe that is the key message that Shakara is aiming to emphasize to us this evening. And I think it's important that we leave with that message ringing in our ears, in our hearts, in our minds. That most importantly, history tells a people where they still must go and what they still must be. History tells a people where they still must go and what they still must be. The duty and the task of history is not completed if history can ever be completed. If the duty of history, if the task of history can ever be completed. But the point is that history 
is past, present, continuous. It is how we preserve the knowledge of the past to inform us of the present in order to anchor ourselves, empower ourselves in the present, and in order to give us a platform for shaping and determining the future. So we are still making history. But what kind of history are we making is the, is, is the essential question. What kind of history are we making? We must be aware that we are still making history. And of course, we, can't, we cannot shape the future correctly if we don't understand the past and how the past has brought us to the present. We cannot shape the future if we don't have a clear sense of our identity as a people, who we are as a people, who our enemies are as a people, how our enemies have historically maintained a system of oppression, exploitation, and degradation. Let me close, beloved brothers and sisters, or pre-close. I always close with the words of the most eminent prophet and king, His Excellency, Marcus Mosiah Garvey. But let me, before I utter the words, my usual closing words, let me shine the torchlight on the words and character of the man whom we regard as the, the father of Black History Month. He is the founder of Negro History Week. He is a great, eminent, grandmaster, teacher, and warrior scholar, Baba Carter G. Woodson. In one writing, he stated, I am not afraid of being sued by white businessmen. In fact, I would welcome such a lawsuit. It would do the cause much good. Note, note that, brothers and sisters. It would do the cause much good if he was sued if he was taken through the rigor of being sued by white businessmen, it would suit the cause. Yeah? It would, it, would, it, it would do the cause much good. Then he says, let us banish fear. Let us banish fear. In other words, let's stand up. Look the enemies in the eye, is what he's saying. In his words again, we have been in this mental state for three centuries. I am a radical, he says. We have been in this state, this mental state for three centuries. He says, I am a radical and I am ready to act if I can find brave men to help me. This is historian. This historian sees himself as a warrior, sees himself in a fight. Everything he did was to empower our people in the fight for our total liberation. And I hope that we are going to leave this gathering, this virtual gathering this evening, clear about the message that we have received and clear about that part of the message that is designed to urge us to understand that we are still in this fight we are still making history we are still fighting the enemy who waged the ma'afa against us the invasion the conquest of africa the enslavement of Africans, the colonization of Africa and African people, the neo-colonization of Africa and African people, and globalization as he moves to maintain dominion over the planet. Let us understand that we are warriors. Let us understand that history, amongst other things, is a weapon of war, and that unless 
we control the narrative of our history we are using somebody else's weapon against ourselves we are fighting in the corner of the enemy and we are aiming by using the enemy's account of our history we are aiming the arsenal of the enemy against ourselves that is a war we can never win when we use the enemy's frames of reference we are using aiming the enemy's arsenal against ourselves that is a war we cannot win and so in the spirit of collective consciousness i close with the words of the most eminent prophet and king his excellency marcus Mosiah Garvey, who says unite organize now or perish and we cannot unite and we cannot organize except on the basis of collective consciousness unite organize now or perish rise you mighty african people for you can accomplish whatever you will africa to the god of africa be the glory tendaimare tendaimare give thanks and praises brothers and sisters tendaimare tendaimare mm -hmm. uh, brother olatunje I, I guess you will be announcing the uh the topic for my presentation um it was sent to you i can right Right, I don't have any detail like when and where and the kind of thing, though. Okay. Okay, then I'm worried. Yeah, right. We'll brothers and sisters know, but I can, I can confirm that the topic will be uh, a conversation with black youth. Time to step up and take the African revolution forward. Okay. A conversation with black youth time to step up and take the african revolution forward tender thanks for that uh brother leader tender my family give thanks for joining us here this evening mr amatai did you have any closing words? just to say that um you know it's an honor and a pleasure to be here to administer to our people and um you know in uh, in this um you know great season um this great month of um black history month which um our ancestors uh the great uh, carter g woodson created and passed on to us and which um um uh, baba adai sable brought over to the uk it's a vitally important institution we cannot um allow um, this legacy to 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 wither and to and to go by the wayside. We've got to reclaim it, strengthen it, um, build it, and take it forward. Um, you know, it's our responsibility to ensure that um, this gets passed on to each generation into the future. Um, so you know, it, it's it's good to be here, and uh, we just have to really build not just black history month but all the institutions we've got to build our saturday schools we've got to we've got to build everything that's needed um for for our for our liberation and to restore our people to our traditional greatness so and yeah. more brothers and sisters it's good to be here yeah. and i look forward to the other events that are coming up um throughout this uh this month and i'm worried Tell them I give thanks for that sister Amitai and just to say for all further events happening in the Lion Story season, sisters and brothers, go to our keberland.org and you'll get updates. So you just heard announced the, the topic topic of Brother Leader Bandaka's message. Um, a conversation with black youth. Time to step up and take the African Revolution forward. So that's something you don't want to miss, sisters and brothers. Go to our keberland.org to find full details. Uh, where and that and when that's going to be taking place and on a similar theme tomorrow evening sisters and brothers africa picked with al keblan on the big g galaxy .com. we're doing a, a series called making history tomorrow is part three and the subject is how do we create tomorrow's our story 
makers. And to join us in that reasoning, we've got that powerful warrior couple all the way from the USA, Mwalimu Baruti and Ina Ya Baruti as well. So don't join us tomorrow to them brothers, 7 p.m. Um, BST for that reasoning tomorrow evening. This has been The Lion's Story from the Archibald Academy of Excellence, courtesy of the Archibald Revivalist Movement. We give thanks and praise that you can that you joined us this evening. And we just go out with our closing words. So we ask the Gavard Strong, if you're able to, to put your left hand on your heart and raise your right hand in the air, just like this. And we say our closing words. So we remind all of those that joined us this evening to take all that you've heard, all that you've learned and shared out into our community, amongst our families and friends, our place of work and places of study. Let's remind ourselves always to be a shining light onto Africans everywhere. The Africans everywhere know that Mwari, the Bukwane, Ndume, Sudume, Nzambi, Nananyame, the African God, reigned supreme. The Africans everywhere know that it is a joy to be an African. And the Africans everywhere know that liberation is indeed at hand. Tendai Mwari. Give thanks. Give thanks. Just to, the brothers, just to say, please go to alkeblon.org for updates and come back to Alkeblon Way on YouTube. If you missed the Africa Teen Talk, it's there on there now to watch our young people. The kind of people Brother Lee was speaking about taking the African Revolution forward was sharing their insight onto the African world as it is. So give thanks to them, brothers, and we'll see you soon uh, on our next installment of the Lion Story 62. 61. Tendai Mwari. Tendai Mwari. Tendai Mwari.